Ready? Hey. Let's do it. Uh, good evening. This is the City Council, first City Council meeting of uh, 2020. My name is Bob Yates. I'm Mayor Pro Tem. Sam Weaver, our mayor, is um, not feeling well tonight, so I'm going to sit in the chair for him. Um, this is the meeting of City Council for January 7, 2020. Lynette, would you please call the roll? Council Member Brockett? Present. Friend? Here. Joseph? Here. Nagel? Here. Swetlick? Here. Wallach? Here. Weaver? Yates? Here. Young? Present. We have a quorum. Great, thank you. Just a few announcements before we get going. Um, we have no amendments to the agenda, so we're good to go there. Um, open comment closed at six o'clock, um, and we'll take open comment here in a few minutes. Um, we have one public hearing tonight, and that's on Ordinance 8372, which amends our rules relating to accessory dwelling units. Um, if you're here for that, please don't speak at open comment. Instead, please sign up with Heidi over here um, for the um, public hearing on that, which will pro probably start around 7 or 7.15. So if you hang tight on that public hearing, that would be great. Everybody else, please, if you've signed up and, and have been notified that you are on open comment, please come up, come up when we call your name in a few minutes. Um, just one announcement. <clears throat> Tomorrow, uh, January 8th, we will be opening our annual uh, applications for appointments to the various city boards and commissions. It's a great way to be involved in our community. Um, you can go to the uh, boards and commission uh, subpage on the city's website. Uh, the applications will be open from tomorrow morning through Friday, February 14th at 5 p.m. And we encourage uh, folks who are interested in uh, serving our community to um, look at the various opportunities and to consider applying. You can apply actually for more than one board, so if you have more than one you're interested in, please don't hesitate. I think the only requirements, uh, generally speaking, are that you have to have lived in Boulder for one year. You do not need to be a United States resident to serve, but you need to, excuse me, citizen. You must be a resident in Boulder for a year. Thank you, Aaron. But you don't need to be a United States citizen. That was a rule we changed a few years ago. And you must be 18 years of old uh, age. There are a few um, requirements within some of those boards and commissions as far as living in a certain district or um, other things. You'll, you can see that all on the boards and commission website. Anything else, folks, by way of announcement? Okay, I think we're good to go. So let's start with open comment. I don't have the list, so. Just a reminder, everyone has uh, two minutes. Um, please respect that. Uh, and please, um, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the speaker, don't make any um, out loud um, comments. If you agree, you can wave your hands. Darren, thanks. Hi, Darren O'Connor joining you tonight. Um, you're being handed uh, the petition that you probably read a number of times. We got almost 300 by the end of the day today. And I will stop that petition from getting new signatures and sending you more. But uh, I hope that uh, the volume of emails is indicative of the desire of our community to see severe weather shelter opened every night of the, the year. Um, right now, I know that the, what's being contemplated is only for the winter, but I would encourage you to consider uh, the Martin v. Boise case and the Supreme Court deciding not to hear the appeal on that, which said that um, if people cannot get access to shelter, that it is cruel and unusual punishment to make shelter illegal. Um, unfortunately, Boulder is cruel and unusual in the volume of tickets that we give. We, in a study from DU Law, gave out more tickets for camping than any other, than all the other cities combined in this state. Um, I would add that you're gonna hear a lot of numbers from uh, staff and from service providers tonight. And those numbers, are not backed up. I have tried to do open records requests to verify them and have been denied multiple times. I've modified my application, still been denied. And I would remind you that um, I've emailed about this that Kurt Vernhaber, who will probably speak with you tonight, has in one memo in December of 2018 said that we've never turned anyone away from shelter. And then in 2019, one month later in January, wrote in an internal, or excuse me, uh, I have them backwards, but in, in a follow-up memo said that, um, yes, we, we have turned people away. It, 
it's really important to realize that these numbers are soft and that there's no data backing them up. The last thing I wanna say is that we need to follow outcomes for people. We're not finding out what happens to them and I encourage you to include that. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Elise Hudson, Edson. And after Elise will be Corey Hogg. Is Elise here? Corey, you're up if you're here. And following Corey will be Pat Murphy. So firstly, I'm gonna comment again that uh, two minutes is an adequate amount of time for any sort of communication to happen here. Um, beyond that, <clears throat> Boulder deserves a full-time city council earning medium wage and not holding second jobs. This allows the members to hold more community forums and be more and directly involved with the community as their role as policymakers. Second, affirmative uh, proactive action taken by government to register and inform voters on all topics that affect them. Election officials should inform through town halls, education videos, and by going door to door, especially amongst the poorest populations to encourage voting. Boulder needs to lead the way in implementing ranked choice voting with a no confidence vote option. Um, on creating, building regulations, we can create regulations that encourage green roofs and circular structures with green greenery in the middle, gardens and whatnot. As far as homeless shelters, um, when I was in Afghanistan, <laughs> we had to build inside of a 40-foot connex, a shipping container, enough room, enough beds to account for 60 to 80 troops with bag bags and all sorts of gear. Boulder can't seem to manage to offer housing to people on the street. We did that in two days with three people with hammers and nails, and Boulder can't seem to house the people that are dying on the street. I think that's the most serious problem that we can possibly imagine. So the fact that we can't utilize the tools at hand to, to build these people shelters um, because of uh, inappropriate laws or inappropriate codes is inappropriate in itself. Also, well, that's the end of my time, thank you. Corey, if you have more to say, just feel free to send us an email. Patrick Murphy. And following Patrick Murphy will be <laughs> Lynn Siegel. My name is Patrick Murphy, I live in Boulder. This is the continuation of the 24 articles of the Muni Naughty List. The Muni Naughty List, Article 4 taking $4.3 million from other departments and a $1.4 million loan with no certainty of repayment from uni profits. We have been taking money from ourselves the way addicts steal from their own families. The muni is an addiction that has lost touch with reality. Notice that the addiction now demands more time and more money with lots of excuses. This is the pattern of an addiction. Article five, outdated and inaccurate engineering and cost analysis as a basis to form a muni, and because of that, a court case was needed to end the paper muni. In the first few years, bad estimates and assumptions were the basis of the muni. We wisely passed restrictions and requirements on the muni to protect us from uncontrolled muni addiction. We ignored those restrictions and denied that we ignored them, and then city council created a paper muni. The courts finally brought this delusion to an end. The paper muni is again a vapor muni. Article six, ignoring the fact that new renewables like Excel's billion dollar Rush Creek wind farm and the $750 million Cheyenne Ridge wind farm to be completed this year have already increased the stranded cost and a failure to even include stranded cost in recent cost analysis. For eight years, the stranded costs have been given a value of zero in the financial analysis. Thus all the financial projections are corrupt. Stranded cost will never be zero. To be continued with articles seven through 24. Thank you, Patrick. Lynn Siegel, are you here? Okay, moving on to Alice Gunther. And following Alice would be James Duncan.
Good evening. I wanted to speak tonight about mobile homes and lot rents. I wanna thank the city of Boulder for instituting zoning laws that keep the use of land under the, mobile, the home I own more secure. However, with the housing bubble here in Boulder, there is a current unforeseen consequence I and my neighbors are living with right now, random, uncontrolled rent increases. In Boulder Meadows, our lot rent has in been increased three times in one calendar year. In October 2018, my lot rent was $690. January 1st, 2019, it was increased to $725. August 1st, 2019, it was again increased to $747. And January 1st, 2020, it was upped again to $776. With my water bill, I now pay around $812 a month. In one year, I and all of my home-owning home owning neighbors are paying almost $100 a year more to live on the only place we can, land zoned for mobile homes. Please remember that mobile homes are the number one unsubsidized affordable housing in the United States. So you see, just changing the zoning will not protect us. We need to have rent control as the corporations and individual companies will just keep raising the rents until we can't afford to stay in our homes. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Lynn, um, I see you, you've come in. Um, are you ready now? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, do you want to go now or do you want a few minutes to get? Um, just, yeah. Okay, well, we, uh, James, why don't you come on up? And then, Lynn, if you could go after James, that'd be great. Thanks. Bob, I had one comment to Alice. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Alice, just so you know, this is going to be a topic at the state legislature this year. So it's very important that you mobilize and speak to that. Perfect, thank you. Great, thanks, thanks Adam. James? Uh, good evening, Council, my name is James Duncan and I'd like to yield my time to Evan Ravitz. Thanks. Evan Ravitz, North Boulder. One reason I've worked for 30 years for better direct democracy is so that people can participate in lawmaking without running for office. Eleanor Roosevelt said, I'd rather be chloroformed than run for office. <laughs> but personalities dominate politics now. The whole world is suffering in Trump's farce field. And Boulder is being run <coughs> by city attorney Tom Carr and city manager Jane Brodigan, who regularly undermine council and the community. I call for you to fire them. Here is a recording of Tom misleading council in two ways. Uh, I will uh, remind you that this on is uh, unprecedented. No one's ever done this before anywhere in the world, done online petition signing. Um, we, are, we, we have a product. We have uh, asked the um, elections working group to re-engage with us. So we've scheduled a meeting on December 16th to have them go over the contract provisions and the plan and to get their input before we finalize the contract. So. They finalized the contract and notarized it one day before our meeting. And Tom also said this was a world's first, but Arizona has had online petitioning for candidates for seven years. The only difference is the text of the petition. <coughs> Our, um, I've been, I informed Tom in an email, including counsel, but he continues to lie about this. These folks told council and voters that their 27 Charter Amendment 2Q is a charter cleanup when it actually messed up the part of our charter regulating initiatives and referenda. This, rep this resulted in council creating our campaign finance and elections working group. Thanks, Evan. Um, Lynn, I called your name before, uh, before you got here. Do you want, are you ready now? Great, thanks. Lynn Siegel, 538 Dewey. Um, I went to a gathering at the depot last night and there was so much smell in the um, lower level. Um, I had thought that this was resolved because as you know, there's an E. coli issue with CU at Folsom Field into the, the effluent into Boulder Creek. And my understanding was that, oh geez, the city of Boulder had fixed up the um, 
the sewage issue into Goose Creek at the depot, and I was surprised to find most people would not, could not sit there. One person had it, wheezy in their throat and everything. Luckily, I can't smell, so um, that's where all this development is. Like, Biz, Biz West, it's like development as far as the eye can see around here. Um, and if we can't even support our basic infrastructure, that's a problem. Um, the person that put on this gathering is not gonna do it at the depot again. Um, as a result, um, then I come home <laughs> and my neighbors are talking about all the asbestos that is flying around from um, 311 building site and we have these huge winds that's spreading all over Boulder. Um, so can we please get a, a handle on things? That's been a blighted area for two years. There's um, been two fires up there. Um, on the property, um, and we as the neighborhood can't police it ourselves. The other thing is these small efficiency units. People need more open space when they live in the small efficiency units, and we're underfunded on the open space for $400 million, and this is a problem, and the transportation is just, this town isn't designed for this kind of growth. So please, put a break on the growth. Um, and people like me, you know, uh, f people without the family anymore, 3,000 feet, and they're staying in their houses. I want more people than two more in my house when many others can have, you know, quite a few people in their house. Um, thanks, Lynn. Thanks. Eileen Munyer. And after Eileen, it will be uh, Mark Kelband. Hi. I'm speaking to you tonight to ask for your help in fixing our broken health care system and to also ask you to put forth a resolution in support of a single-payer universal health care system. I'll start by sharing the stories of some people who've fallen into the darkness of our current system. Uh, these people are my patients. I work as a PA at Clinica Family Health, a community health center. My first story is about Maria, who is uninsured. Maria fell at home on the stairs and badly fractured her forearm. Her Arms, her bones in her forearm were um, badly displaced and she had some loose fragments in her wrist. Maria clearly needed surgery, but no orthopedist would accept Maria's case. The only option that I had was to put a cast on Maria's forearm and hope for the best healing possible. So now Maria is left with a deformed forearm that's poorly functioning and it impacts her ability to do her work in housekeeping. It also impacts her enjoyment in even picking up her grandchildren. My second story is about Linda. Linda had recently gotten a promotion and a pay raise at work. So now Linda was um, able to buy more than the basic necessities. The bad news was that Linda no longer qualified for Medicaid. And in addition, uh, when low-income people go on the health exchange, they see plans where they would have to pay hundreds of dollars a month to get a plan that has a five or $10,000 deductible, and that's money they don't have. So it makes no sense for them to pay hundreds of dollars and then have no money to pay the rest of the bills for nothing. So uh, Linda chose to go without insurance. That same year, Linda found a lump in her breast. And as we worked up that lump, it turned out to be breast cancer. So now Linda was left with a breast cancer diagnosis and no health insurance. So in closing, I'd like to ask you to put forth a, a resolution in support of single uh, payer health to help the Lindas and the Marias of our community and to help prevent the 45,000 deaths a year that happen because of lack of health care coverage and the half a, not to mention the half a million, million bankruptcies a year in the U.S. Thank you, Eileen. Mark, after Mark Gelband, Bill Semple. Mark Gilban, 505 College. Uh, I'd like to call your attention to um, section 617 of our municipal code titled Improper Care of Animals Prohibited. And I'd like for you to just read it when you contemplate the 48 people who died last year. An animal is deprived of minimum care if it is not provided with care sufficient to preserve the health and well-being of the animal, considering the species. I'd say to all of you that, in essence, 
you guys have not only not been caring for the human animal who are unfortunate to live on the streets of Boulder, but you've gone so far as to being complicit in negligent homicide of those 48 people and anyone else who dies on the streets. Let me continue in section A3. In, ca in the case of a pet or other domestic animals, other than livestock or poultry, access to a barn or doghouse or other enclosed structure sufficient to protect the animal from wind, rain, snow, or sun, and which has adequate bedding to protect against cold and dampness. I want to thank Darren O'Connor for all the work he's done to consistently be here in front of you and call attention to this issue. But I will just say that it is morally reprehensible for any of you to sit up there and allow one more person to die on the streets of Boulder because they can't use a sleeping bag on the coldest night of the year. They can't lay down with a blanket or a raincoat or something that gives a tarp um, on a night when it is cold. Because I can tell you this, if I left my little dog pirate out on a cold night in December and he died, I'd have a ticket or I'd be in jail for animal cruelty. Thanks, Mark. Oop, please. Please, no, um, no um, out loud expressions. Just wave your hands if you're supportive. Bill? After Bill Semple, uh, Madeline Goldstein. Uh, good evening. I'm Bill Semple. I'm a City of Boulder resident, and uh, I'm the board chair of the Colorado Foundation of Universal Health Care. In, in line with our mission to create simple, guaranteed health care for all for life, I ask that the council pass a resolution in support of improved Medicare for all. We really can pay much less, and cover everyone with better health care. And all three of these are important. Paying less, covering everyone, and better health care. Many, other, many others and I see no other way to accomplish these important goals with, without, except with the much administratively simpler improved Medicare for all. Indeed, the majority of Americans support Medicare for all. And across the country, volunteers are going to the cities and counties and their school boards uh, asking that you to uh, pass a similar resolution. The importance of speaking up is that the cartel of the insurance, drug, and big hospital corporations is adamantly opposed to Medicare for all. The successful, well-funded, powerful cartel takes the necessary resource of our need for health care, limits that resource by having uninsured and underinsured, and then charges us whatever. And that's why we pay twice as much per person as other countries that cover everyone <coughs> and they have better outcomes. We need health care that serves our needs and not just the needs of those at the top of the the insurance, drug, and big, big hospital corporations. We need a politics that supports our pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, essential to wish is having health care that each of us can afford. Please join us and the other governments across the country with a loud voice and resolve that the city of Boulder supports Medicare for all. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Madeline Goldstein followed by Nicole Perlman. Madeline here. Nicole, you're up. After Nicole will be um, Lee Lode Rosenthal. Thank you so much. I really ap appreciate everybody's time tonight. Um, I'm an old lady. 17 years ago, I got a master's in public policy. And what mostly stuck with me from that experience was that really good public policy is based on two things. It's based on a good understanding of data, but it's also based on ethics. So the issue I wanted to briefly talk about tonight was the homeless policy. Um, first of all, when the city made certain decisions in 2017, they were based on really, really bad data. Um, basically, you had a decision that the severe weather shelter would only be open certain nights because the data showed that people died regardless of whether it was open or not. Um, first of all, I would say this is a horrible <laughs> relationship between causation and correlation. Um, but also, if you look at the data from this year, 48 people died. So obviously, following the city's own logic, having the severe weather shelter closed on certain nights caused people to die, if you follow that logic. Um, but beyond that, I would argue that 
looking at death is a really, really low bar. I mean, can we really sink any lower? I mean, the average cost to treat hypothermia or frostbite for an ER visit can range anywhere from $150 to $20,000. So even if people aren't dying on the streets, somebody's paying for their health care if they're outside freezing at night. And guess what? It's the taxpayers. Um, so you have a bad policy based on bad data. But second of all, if you think about the ethics, look, we tell people in the city of Boulder they have to prove they're a resident here for 60 days to get access to homeless services. How is a homeless person supposed to prove they're a resident here? I'm sorry, about 60 days, six months. Um, and then we say, oh, well, we do such a great job serving the people that have been here for six months. Well, guess what? That's really cherry picking the data because you have hundreds, if not thousands of people who have still been here for longer than six months, who can't prove they've been here for six months and still need services. Those people are not allowed to camp. But if the severe weather shelters close, they have nowhere to go for shelter. So what's their option? You're basically saying if you're homeless in Boulder, you're illegal. Thanks, Nicole. Lila Rosenthal, followed by um, Nina Amabile. <coughs> Hello, my name is Lila Rosenthal. I'm here today to request that the Boulder City Council adopt a resolution in favor of single-payer universal health care in our city. <coughs> I've been a practicing family physician for 12 and a half years in Colorado, and for most of that time I had the unique privilege of running a private practice taking care of the amazing people of Boulder County. Um, my practice was called My Family Doctor, and I took care of all comers, from folks dealing with homelessness to the extremely well-off. And in March of 2019, I made the incredibly heart-wrenching decision to close my practice. The reasons were many, but chief among them was the decision to stop allowing myself to be abused by for-profit insurance companies who systematically denied payments for basic services, including sometimes immunizations, because they can get away with it and because providers can only fight so many battles. There's nothing like being in private practice to understand very intimately the many ways that big insurance is squeezing doctors and in turn patients. You frequently hear about burnout among healthcare professionals, but I want to make it very clear that burnout is a blame the victim term, and many of us are starting to use the term moral injury to convey the abuse that we feel on many fronts, but most egregiously from for-profit insurance companies. There's a bumper sticker that says, if you aren't completely outraged, you're not paying attention. And I know there are so many fronts for outrage in American public life today, but I sincerely believe that if we all had the same insurance card in our wallets, cards that don't have restricted provider networks, cards that stay with us whether we lose a job, get a divorce, move out of state, other, or otherwise fall on hard times, cards that level the healthcare playing field, that it would be a rising tide that raises all ships. Single payer universal health care, such as improved Medicare for all, would make this a reality. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lila. Nina Mobley, followed by Ali Catherine Wild. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to speak about keeping the emergency shelter open. Um, I imagine that almost all of us have been affected by addiction, mental illness, under or unemployment, or unforeseen emergency. Oh, unforeseen emergency expenses. I know that in my own family, um, I have an adult child who would be homeless um, if I were not able to support him. Uh, Misery and suffering do not cure addiction or other illnesses, much less homelessness. People deserve basic shelter and care. All of us deserve support and kindness. The very least we can do is provide shelter in any weather. On the other hand, we could also follow the model in Seattle and build a village to house the homeless people. Thank, Thank you, you, Nina. Ali Catherine, and after Ali Catherine, uh, we have Marie <coughs> Adams. Good evening. I'm Allie Catherine Wild. I live at Third and Pearl. Glad to be a resident of Boulder. Glad to see everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, so 
I had a complaint to make, but I gotta tell you, a lot of it has been worked out with the help, the direct help of Diane Marshall and Debbie Stamp, especially Diane Marshall, because I was having difficulties having my files uploaded. I cried because I couldn't get my files uploaded because I like show and tell. The difficulty is the show and tell and the reason for my concern. So this is, it's a chunk of sidewalk. It's very new. It was poured in a construction site and the complaint is, uh-oh, it's not ADA. I live at 3rd and Pearl, which is Glen Willow, city housing of Boulder, and I wanted accessibility for people who need accessibility. It's the only path that would allow somebody to reach um, laundry and maybe garbage. So, so here, right, this, is, this is what I cried about. I gotta show my pictures. Ultimately what happened from Diane Marshall's suggestion, she said, why don't you talk to planning? So I called planning. And do you see the big happy blue stripe over there? That's legal ADA and the foreground is another ramp that is probably at 18% grade. And I think the ADA is limit is 8% now because I learned this today. The inspectors did come out, so I went to planning. Ultimately, they said, hey, call, we'll send the inspectors out. And the inspectors came and they said, we don't deal with internal sidewalks, but we can help. So I believe, see this is an unpoured area. I wanted to make sure that there was gonna be accessibility for on our site. Wow, my time is up. Your time's up, Allie. But, um, uh, th thanks so much for saying nice things about the staff and it sounds like you're on the right path. Thank you. Marie Adams. After Marie, we'll have uh, Michelle Rodriguez. Hi, Marie Adams, 4507 Southampton Circle in Boulder, 80301. Um, I'm here to ask you to pass a resolution in support of Medicare for All. Uh, right now, the current system is unsustainable. A few years ago, a report came out that uh, Paul Ryan quoted 32.6 will be the cost over the next <coughs> decade. But what he failed to tell you is that at the current system, it's going to be 50 million to us. Um, in addition to that, employers in 2019, a family of four with employee or paid health care, paid $6,015 out of the $20,576 premium. <laughs> Now take that to our level here at the state and then down to the city of Boulder. How much would this municipality cost, uh, pay if Medicare for All was available on a government program? Those funds that this city would save that they pay insurance premiums for the employees can be put to the services that are now underfunded. <coughs> the school boards would not have to negotiate every year and save money. Um, and some of the other things that would be affected would be uh, right now, employees, as I said, are, are employers are paying $20,576 per employee. Um, with a 4.5 personal tax, um, that would save people over $27,000 a year. Um, employers would pay 7.5 per employee. Oh, sorry. Sounds like you got a lot of information, Marie. Uh, feel um, free to email to us. Well, we and did give you booklets, which have been great. And please go through them because there's a lot of pertinent information um, that would on a local level, save this municipality money that could be used elsewhere. Thanks so much, Marie. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez, and after Michelle, uh, Steve Whitaker. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I'm one of Boulder's formerly homeless people. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of uh, needing year-round shelter, but I wanna remind y'all that you'll see my face again, because last year I spoke on April 16th here, and it was about being criminalized as a homeless person. Um, I've since had my day in court, and I was found not guilty of my charges by reason of self-defense against the Boulder Police Department. I'll have you guys know they recommended 
I uh, sue and, and do a tort claim instead of doing any kind of uh, criminal charges against the police officers, and I'm being denied restraining orders against these officers. I also want you guys to know, um, I memorialized 48, 49 of our homeless people the other day, and um, this week we'll memorialize parts of, of one of our homeless people, a gentleman, Steve Agro. He, he's been in respite care. I'm not sure if they still have him in respite care. I'm not sure why he's still got the tips of his fingers because all of them are due to be surgically removed due to frostbite. He, he suffers from substance abuse. He's, he's one of the many, and, and mental issues. Um, he deserves shelter. He deserves shelter year round. He has a housing voucher. He doesn't have the support he needs. We've done a lot, but we haven't done enough. I was criminalized to the point where I was chemically sedated out here, right here in front of your municipal building. That's what I was found not guilty by reason of self-defense by. I had one of your largest police officers testify proudly to having been on my back. I was found to be sober. I had no warrants. I had no mental health holds. I need you guys to wake up. We're not only dying from exposure to the elements, we're dying from exposure to the people and the elements, the people that just can't see through us, or rather are looking right through us as people. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Michelle. Steve Whitaker, followed by Rachel Daly. I'm Steve Whitaker, a uh, nearly 47-year resident of Boulder. And why we would want to rent forever when we can own our electric, our electric distribution system is beyond me. Yes, it will be expensive to buy. Yes, we have spent a lot of money so far. But I view this as a down payment required to own our distribution system and to have the freedom to choose our source of electrical power in a competitive marketplace. Who among those who are renting their residence don't wish that their monthly payments were going towards ownership of the property? Renting makes sense when the property under consideration is going to be used for a short or an uncertain period. But the city of Boulder is going to be here for a very long time, <laughs> hopefully forever. We should make our financial dis decisions accordingly. While the initial costs <coughs> seem steep, the long-term benefits are great, both economically and environmentally. We need to take the long view. While spending hundreds of millions to own our electrical distribution system seems daunting, let me remind you that as renters of this system, we will pay all of that and many times more over time and never own any of it. Stopping our quest for a municipal electric utility this year would be a huge mistake. We have spent millions of dollars and years to get this to this point. Let's stay the course until we see what the full cost will be and then decide. Thanks, Steve. Rachel Daly followed by Sarah Jean Cohen. Hi, I want to talk today also about um, the homeless, the issue with the homeless shelter not being opened every night. Um, as Nicole said, I don't think that the metric should be just deaths that we're looking at. This is a human issue. There's a lot of different kinds of suffering besides just death that I think we need to look at. And I think we do need to make sure that we're keeping track of some kind of data. Um, I'm, I'm concerned. So I, I did write to council and I got, um, an email back and one of the things that was said was that you're con currently working to perform an architectural review to determine the feasibility of certain specific sites, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'd like to say um, is that because we did see so many people die last year um, on our streets, 
we need to not only make sure that emergency emergency shelter is available um, because there will always be a need for that. But we also need to reconsider our camping ban and um, just think about what it means to criminalize people who don't even have enough money to have a roof over their heads. So please, please consider leaving the severe weather shelter open, especially during these winter months where even if it's not the temperature, it's the wind as we all saw last night. Um, <laughs> that can cause, I mean, I just can't even imagine how it must have been to be sleeping outside last night. So please consider that and um, remember that these are people are part of our community too. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Sarah Jane Cohen. Is Sarah Jane here? Oh, hey, there you are, Sarah Jane. <laughs> Take your time. You're our last one. Hello, my name is Sarah Jane Cohen. I'm gonna read this because it's a lot. I've lived in the city of Boulder for over 50 years and have worked as a volunteer with the homeless community for over 40. As you review the report on homelessness tonight, please consider these three points. One, the city cannot make sleeping on public property illegal unless there are legal sleeping options available. The right to sleep is a constitutional right. Two. The city may not impose conditions on those sleep options beyond minimal rules of conduct designed to support the reasonable functioning and management of the venues. Three, these rules apply to anyone in the city, not just residents, however that's defined. City staff say that because there are empty beds at the shelter and path to home, legal sleep options are available, and therefore the city may arrest and prosecute people who sleep on public property. This argument is disingenuous and misleading. Both the shelter and path to home have eligibility requirements for homeless men and women to use their beds as part of the agency's structured programs. The only walk-up shelter available to all is the severe weather shelter, which is only open half the year and then only on nights when the weather is bad enough. People who don't want or, to, or, or who have been deemed ineligible for the structured programs face many nights with no legal sleep options. Referencing open beds in structured programs is meaningless when some people are barred from using those beds. There are people in institutions in Boulder, including but not limited to the faith community, prepared to help the city meet its obligation to provide legal sleep options for unhoused men and women. But the city must provide the leadership, resources, and support. Boulder prides itself on being a progressive and compassionate city, but unfortunately, on this issue, the city is providing no leadership at all. Rather, it is being shamefully punitive and short-sighted. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Oops, please. Um, we're just gonna turn to, that's the end of uh, open comment. We're gonna turn to staff for any um, comments or statements. No real additional information, though of course we have um, a session later tonight under matters from the city manager to talk about the homeless strategy and we'll be having some data with regard to um, the unfortunate deaths in our community, so. Thanks, Jane. Anything from you, David? I'm available for questions. Okay, I'm in questions from council members. Mary. <coughs> so this question is for staff. Um, in the, um, rulemaking for the mobile home um, legislation that passed last year. I believe there was an allowance for a um, lease that would prevent rent increases twice a year. Is that, am I remembering correctly? I don't, I don't know, so David. Yeah, I, I, would, I would have to just look that up and I can follow up um, after the meeting. That'd be great, um, because that would be at least one way to prevent one um, extra rate um, rent increase during the year. So um, so that's one question. And then um, I had another question about um, the state and federal legislative agenda. Mm -hmm. Is um, healthcare currently in the legislative agenda? You know, Mary, I, I don't know. I've talked with Carl about it and Carl Castillo. 
our um, policy advisor, and my understanding is that he is hopeful that the council will refer the question of Medicare for all to the council's legislative committee, and that when that group meets, I think in February, that this particular issue will be discussed and then brought back to council about whether or not to add that to the legislative agenda. And the next opportunity to add it to the legislative agenda is? I, what I saw today on the forward-looking agenda is that there would be a meeting of the committee in February and it would come forward at the March meeting, I think the first meeting in March. Great, thank you. Yes. All right. And so um, Ms. Wild uh, brought up questions about ADA compliance on internal walkways at a BHP property and, and she was mentioning that maybe inspector said, well, we don't look at internal walkways, but, but I assume there would be code compliance, right, that you would any uh, structure would be required to be code compliant. Is that a fair statement? That, that's a fair statement. Good. So maybe we can just check in uh, with her to make sure that the, the right inspector or the right people are contacted to make sure that those walkways are code compliant. But great. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Henry. No, Allie Catherine, but, but, um, but thanks for calling that to our attention. We will follow up on Allie Catherine. Thank and, you. And feel free to follow up with an email. Okay. Rachel, do you have something? Okay, anybody else? Questions? Okay, great. Ready to move on. Your consent agenda tonight contains items A through G. Okay. Do you want to call out that um, <clears throat> I, with the help of Mary, proposed an amendment to item 3E, which is resolution 1276 in support of the Community Choice Energy, which I believe is in the white sheet, the revised draft, um, <coughs> if Folks want to accept that amendment is on the white sheet on our dais. Um, any, any comments or discussion on, on the consent agenda before we take a motion? Mary? I just had one question with regards to item B, um, the rifle club um, <coughs> authorization. There was a mention in there of uh, $30,000 that they're gonna pay for improvement on user <coughs> experience. And I was just curious to know what kind of user experience can be bought for $30,000. I don't think that that has been um, programmed yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. That, that was my question. That's all. Any other questions or comments, Rachel? Um, I also had one on the rifle club agreement. Um, it, it said in, in the materials that um, it's currently used for disposal of explosive materials, and uh, that just concerned me a little bit, combining that with guns. I, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we thought through that or, or, or clarify if there were concerns. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll take a look at that. Okay. Um, and then on the vaping tax, I think we got an email. Um, about cigarettes, and I wanted to clarify, does this only apply to uh, e-cigarettes and not cigarettes being taxed through what we're looking at tonight? That's correct. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on the consent agenda? If not, I entertain a motion <laughs> to um, uh, move the consent agenda, and please indicate, if you do, whether you um, accept the amendment to Resolution 1276. So I'll move the consent agenda with uh, item E as amended. Mark seconds. Is this a um, roll call or? It is a roll call. Okay. We begin with Council Member Yates. Aye. Young? Yes. Brockett? Aye. Friend? Yes. Joseph? Yes. <coughs> Nagel? Yes. Swalwick? Yes. Wallach? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. What's next? You have one call up check in this evening. It's an easement vacation for 6949 Winchester Circle. Anybody have any interest in calling this up? See no takers, we'll move on. Okay, your public hearing is second reading of Ordinance 8372, amending the subsection on accessory units. So as staff's getting settled in, I'm gonna make a, a, maybe a process suggestion because this is a, a pretty uh, meaty topic with lots of little parts in it. So we're, we're gonna hear a presentation, I think, from staff first, and then we will all have an opportunity to ask staff any questions about their presentations, and then we'll open the public hearing. And by the way, if you haven't signed up yet and you wanna sign, if you wanna speak to this ADA matter, please do sign up here in the next few minutes. 
Um, and then after public hearing, we'll ask any follow-up questions to staff. And then staff has kind of five propositions for us to consider. And I, I might suggest, because it gets a little complicated as to which amendment applies to which, that we might go through and discuss each one, one through five, and maybe take a little bit of a mini straw poll on each of those as we go through. And then based upon how those straw polls come out, David, maybe you can help us determine what, what, we're, what we're actually gonna pass here tonight, you know, with attachment B or attachment C or whether there's any modifications necessary. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Good evening, council members. Uh, the purpose of tonight is for council to consider second reading of ordinance 8372, which seeks to make some code clarifications and code cleanups related to accessory dwelling unit standards uh, in the land use code. Uh, there also are some additional attachments that we'll talk about uh, that are to be considered as amendments uh, when if approved uh, as the amendments would require third reading of the ordinance and we'll go into detail on those. So just a little bit of background, uh, the accessory dwelling unit or ADU regulations were actually originally adopted by the city over 20 years ago um, as creating some an additional alternative housing choice for the city. Um, there was an update that was approved by city council in December of 2018. Uh, those regulations went into effect of February of 2019. So we're coming up on almost a year of implementation of those standards. So during that time, uh, staff has been looking at the code implementation and, and discovering some ambiguities that are in the code and some unanticipated situations that we felt should be uh, resolved sooner rather than later because it has led to some applications being denied and obviously we're trying to make it uh, somewhat easier for ADUs to be established in the city. Uh, so we wanted to go over some of those. So we've identified some barriers. We've also found some somewhat like loopholes or ambiguities that exist in the code that we wanted to clarify. So the overall intent of the ordinance when we started the project was basically to do these code cleanups and limited updates and then doing some more extensive changes later. So moving on to the, the content of the packet, uh, there are three attachments to the memo. Uh, I'm gonna talk about them in, a, in kind of a high level and then Andrew's gonna go into a little bit more detail on each. So the first is attachment A, which is the original ordinance that staff had prepared um, which is focused on these code cleanups and code clarifications. Um, so what that includes is some new language related to the roof pitch, uh, pitch ratio uh, for buildings that are between 20 and 25 feet in height. These are detached structures um, where we're trying to encourage conversion of existing uh, buildings to ADUs. Um, there's the cleanup of the ADU occupancy language uh, that, that's proposed in the ordinance. There's also um, an, an architectural design consistency provision that we're proposing that applies specifically to new construction uh, rather than all buildings. Uh, and then also making a clarification that ADUs in a co-op cannot exist on the same property, which is something that the code is silent on right now. So attachment B actually contains the planning board recommendation. So the, the selections up on the screen that are underlined are those areas that uh, are different between attachment A and B. So A is the original ordinance. Uh, attachment B has some changes that planning board had recommended. So rec the planning board recommended that the architectural design consistency provision for all detached ADUs be removed. Uh, they also wanted to make it explicit in the code that an ADU and a co-op could exist on the same property. Uh, and they, they said that that would be based on the condition that it be part of the co-op. Uh, and that this, there would not be an increase in occupancy. It would have to follow the existing code regulations for occupancy for, for co-ops that's in the code now. And one thing that came up after staff started developing the ordinances was a, an email that talked about some circumstances where uh, in other communities there's been condominiumization of ADUs. Um, condominiumization cannot be prohibited by state law but it could be something that could happen in the city. We've not seen any instances of it, but we're proposing some code languages uh, to address that. So the, the project began in um, October of this year and we brought it to, to uh, planning board on November 21st. So planning board recommended approval of the ordinance with a seven uh, to zero vote, but they did ask for those changes that I was talking about. So limiting 
um, occupancy uh, to the co-op, allowing ADUs and co-ops on the same lots, uh, and wholly removing the architectural design standard. Uh, these are reflected in attachments uh, B. And then attachment C uh, comes from planning board's request that we address that condo uh, issue that was raised. Um, so we'll talk about that. <coughs> so since we started the project in October, we've done published and online notices. We've informed applicants and pre-applicants of the, of the potential changes. We also had the planning board hearing in November. Um, attachment D contains some of the written public comments that we've received. Uh, there's been a range of opinions on the project, uh, starting with uh, some emails from the Boulder Community Housing Association, which has expressed support for allowing ADUs and co-ops on the same lot. And you've seen some additional uh, correspondence coming through over the past few weeks uh, for and against that provision. Uh, there's been also some instances where people are opposed to co-ops on the same lot with ADUs. Uh, there's people on both sides about removing the architectural provision or keeping it in. Uh, and then there's that, that extensive email on the condo piece that's also found within the packet. So I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew now who's gonna talk about the, the code changes um, in more detail. Great, and good evening, uh, Council. So we'll go through each of these one at a time so we can pause if you wanna have some discussion after each of these topics. So the first two changes are to the ADU design standards. Uh, currently, legally existing accessory structures may be unable to reasonably convert to a detached ADU if the structure conflicts with the existing or the current ADU design standards, specifically the requirement for a roof pitch ratio of 8 to 12 or greater for structures that are 20 feet or taller in height, and also the requirement that the detached ADU be architecturally design, uh, consistent in terms of its design with the existing residence or adjacent buildings on the side yards of the lot. And these make sense to be applied to new construction. They can incorporate these elements in the development, but it's, but it's more difficult for um, existing structures to um, renovate to these requirements. So in this example shown here on the screen, on the, we have an existing, legally existing accessory structure that does not meet the current roof pitch ratio standard of eight to 12 or greater. So it's over 20 feet in height, uh, but its roof pitch is only six to 12, so it's too flat. Um, eight to 12 means it's, the roof is eight feet vertically and 12 feet horizontally measured from the center point of the roof. So the first proposed code change is to uh, remedy the situation. So again, the current standard requires a roof pitch of eight to 12 for all structures greater than 20 feet in height. So the code change is simply to provide an administrative modification process to the standard. And this is contained both within the proposed ordinance and attachment A and also in the attachment B alternative amendments. The second proposed code change is regarding the architectural design consistency provision. Again, this requires an architectural design such as uh, the general style or the facade to be consistent with the existing residents on the site. Um, staff is proposing to modify this provision to apply only to new construction only as opposed to all det detached ADUs. The uh, alternative amendment in attachment B reflects planning board's recommendation to um, wholly remove the provision altogether. A staff's recommendation is the proposed change in attachment A, um, finding that uh, a wholesale removal might be more of a change outside the scope of the project that might warrant more community discussion. Before we move on to, yeah. well, why don't we go ahead and take a pause here because I see people taking notes and maybe has people have questions whether they're still fresh in their minds. Do you have questions of staff on um, proposals one and two, one or two? Anybody? Good, okay. Oh, Mark, did you have something? Do we know how many uh, parcels of property we actually calculated for ownership? I don't think you're on that. Do we know how many parcels of property uh, the relief relating to roof pitch would apply to? We have a handful of applications that have come in over the cor course of the year uh, seeking to convert some of their structures to a detached ADU. Uh, there's one, I believe, current case that's kind of pending this decision. In terms of potential, I'm not sure how many accessory structures you know, are out there that would be impacted by this. Um, but okay, thank you. Mary? As long as we're paused, I have a question. Um, 
Is staff keeping data on um, denials for ADUs? I, I think staff is. We have a pretty extensive uh, matrix, matrix monitoring all the incoming uh, applications and wait lists and everything, so I believe we are. Okay, um, so when this comes in for its formal review, we'll be able to see some of that data. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions on changes one and two, Rachel? So I wanna make sure I'm following. If we are limiting architectural design consistency for new construction, well, let's say you have a house that is really dated. If you're doing a new ADU, you have to match that under this proposal? You have to match yeah, I mean, like the yeah, house that's when existing? At, when we look at the house design, we'd be looking at kind of the materials. It may not necessarily have to be like the same style, but I think we look at color and materiality to determine consistency. But let's say you have like a, a heinous home and you wanna add an ADU to it. You have to make that ADU match the house under this, is that, is that true? So that's the existing regulation today to all detached ADUs it would be the house on the lot or it's the adjacent houses along the side yards of the lot. That would be the requirement today. Okay. And so, so just to be following up on Rachel, so the um, uh, alternative amendment attachment B would, would avoid the heinous house situation, is that right? <laughs> because it wouldn't require matching Correct. Okay, thanks. Any other comments, questions on one and two? Go ahead and move on to three then. Okay, great. So the third proposed change is regarding uh, cooperative housing units and ADUs being developed on the same property. Uh, this was not a scenario that was anticipated at the time of the co-op or ADU regulations uh, adoption in 2017 and 2018, respectively. As such, the code does not currently expressly indicate whether you can have an ADU and a co-op on the same property. However, there are different standards <laughs> for each regarding occupancy that would require interpretation for such a scenario to be implemented today under the current regulations. Uh, thus, it's not clear if such an allowance was actually intended uh, during the adoption of these codes. So the third code change, as Carl talked about, is to address this existing ambiguity in the code. The proposed ordinance uh, was simply proposing to uh, prohibit the establishment of both the co-op and ADU on the same property. This is in attachment A. The attachment B alternative amendment option uh, reflects the planning board's recommendation. So this would expressly allow both the co-op and ADU on the same lot or property with some ex uh, additional clarifications that the occupancy would be limited, limited to that of the co-op only. There'd be no increase in occupancy with the ADU. The ADU would also, uh, the residents of the ADU would have to be part of the co-op as well. And then any additional um, ADU saturation calculations, there's a 20% limitation and the um, RL zoning districts in terms of the number of lots that can have an ADU. Uh, that currently counts a co-op as part of that calculation. There's a clarification that simply states that in this instance, it would only count once when it be counted twice in that calculation. Great, so let's pause there. Um, <coughs> take on any questions on change number three, Aaron? Yeah, thank you for that. So um, I understand that when you were saying before that the issues, you, you were bringing this forward because you felt there were issues that needed to be resolved. And, and uh, my impression was that planning board uh, tried hard to resolve those issues. And I'm wondering if you see any lingering problems given planning board's approach to it like that would require us to say no to this. I don't think we've identified any problems with the modified language to reflect the planning board recommendation. Um, I think our recommendation to not adopt it now is more along the lines of this hasn't had a lot of public discourse uh, it kind of grew out of the planning board discussion and, and we felt that maybe it needs more time and consideration before it gets adopted, but we didn't identify anything wrong with the language as it's written now. Okay, so you don't have any objections to the approach they took? You just feel like maybe we should talk to folks a little more? No, we, uh, we don't uh, based on, on the content. I mean, it's a configurational kind of situation within the co-op. It's not increasing the occupancy, but again, uh, we wanna make sure that you know people are aware of it. Thank you. Other questions on change number three, Rachel? Was there any um, public engagement at planning board? Uh, there were some folks that came and spoke to the planning board for and against some of these changes. Any other on change number three? Mark? Uh, how many existing co-ops are there in town? <laughs> there's only, there's eight existing uh, co-ops under the <laughs> regulations and then three existing uh, non-conforming approved uses that function as co-ops as well. And are there any pending applications? No, no applications in uh, the previous year currently. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mary. So we got a letter um, from the Boulder Housing Coalition that talked about how there are two co-ops that essentially have attached ADUs. Um, I, think, I believe it was to attached apartments and an, uh, an approved boarding house with 18 units. So it also would not be uh, impacted by this change um, at all. So this, they could continue to operate. Thank you. Other questions on change number three? Mark? So if I understand correctly, this change would apply to precisely zero uh, properties in town at the moment? Uh, that's, that's correct. There's no um, of the eight co-ops that we know of that are currently approved. Um, none of them have an ADU on their property. There have been some um, folks that have expressed interest in this option, so it's why we're okay. addressing it. Adam? You might not have a, the answer to this, but if a co-op were to want to build an ADU, would they collectively just have to raise the money in order to do so? Like, are there rules surrounding how co-ops change their physical existence? I mean, they would have to follow the ADU process, <clears throat> and as owners on the property, they would have to all sign the application that they could. And that wouldn't present any issues in itself, having up to, what is it, eight or 10 people signing an ADU application? Cool. Mary? So that raises kind of a follow-up question um, with respect to the existing co-ops. How many of them are ownership co-ops and how many of them are rental co-ops? Because you probably wouldn't do this if it's a rental co-op. Yeah, looking at the table now, um, seven of the eight are rental co-ops and then one is listed as a uh, not-for-profit slash affordable co-op, so that would be operated by probably a third party um, housing uh, partnership. Thank you. Other questions? I had a question. Um, how, how would um, the parking rule, the respective park, parking rules coordinate? Because I, we, we have two types of ADUs that have two different type of parking requirements and then we have a separate set of parking requirements for co-ops. How would they, can you speak to that? I mean, I think we'd have to look at them both, but they do have different requirements. So uh -huh. the co-op regs say that you just have to submit a parking plan right. and you have to demonstrate that no more than three vehicles will end up in the public right of way. The ADU regs just require one additional um, parking space on the property. So we want to, would want to make sure that we look at both of those and that those two requirements are met. And then we have another type of ADU, which if it's permanently or not permanently affordable, it's an affordable ADU, or I think we called them type twos or whatever we called them when we made this up, that don't require a parking requirement, is that right? That's right, so if they met that affordable requirement, there wouldn't be a parking requirement for that. So, okay, so what, what, just since we're writing laws here, what, 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 would the, what do we tell the public the rules are with respect to um, parking on these, if, if ever there was an exist, if everyone, everyone came forward and said, I wanna do a co-op slash ADU, what, what are the rules? Um, again, it's going to be, you know, if they're, if they're not going to do an affordable, there'd be an uh, additional space requirement on the site for the ADU. So we'd have to make sure that that's met. And then secondarily, you know, the co-op regs are, are, are somewhat discretionary in terms okay. of the parking plan. It's, it's basically they have to demonstrate to the city that they're not going to present any impact more than three cars in the right of way. So we're just going to have to look at both of those together. So your interpretation would be, um, even though the co-op rules are relatively discretionary and may not require parking, if there's an ADU on site, they would have to comply at least with the ADU rules, is that right? That's right. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. Juni? Thank you, I, I'm just a little bit confused because if, for instance, the original building is probably bigger than the ADU, so why would you even require extra parking? Because I think that would just make it this restriction would make it even harder for someone to get access to an ADU. It could, I mean, the, the occupancy uh, would still be the same, the same standard between the two, but certainly an option of council is to amend that to not have that requirement. Okay, anything else on, re on number three? Let's move on to four. Okay, so the fourth code change is a uh, cleanup to the AD, ADU occupancy language and definitions. Uh, currently, there's inconsistent terminology across uh, the accessory units and occupancy section of the code as well as definitions. The language shifts at different points in times between persons and rumors in an inconsistent manner. 
So this is a fairly straightforward code change. It just aligns a code language uh, in a more consistent fashion between persons and rumors. It creates a new definition uh, for rumors in the code and updates the accessory dwelling unit definition as well. Um, importantly, it does not change the number of occupants that are, are allowed. It simply clarifies the existing language, and this is found within both attachment A and attachment B options. Great. Any questions on change four? Pretty straightforward. Go ahead. Yeah. So the last uh, proposed code change is regarding this, the issue of a separate sale and condominium ownership of ADUs. As Carl mentioned, uh, Planning Board requested this consideration as an additional item for this uh, proposed ordinance. Uh, state law does prohibit local governments from prohibiting condominium form of ownership. And here in Boulder, the creation of condominiums occurs with a recording of a plot and other documents with the county clerk's office. There's no city review process for it. Um, regardless of the ownership regime, any development, including an accessory dwelling unit, still has to comply with the city's land use code uh, standards and the declarations of use that are recorded as well. Again, as Carl mentioned, we're not currently aware of this being an issue here in Boulder yet um, with ADUs being condoed out and sold separately. Um, that said, the uh, proposed ordinance as passed on first reading does not address this issue as it was raised um, after the ordinance was drafted. The attachment C option uh, would expressly prohibit the sale of an ADU independent of the principal drilling unit on the lot or parcel, and staff is recommending approval of that option at this time. So. Okay, great. Questions on change number five. Aaron. Can you just give a quick uh, rationale for, for your recommendation? Yeah, essentially the ADU is an accessory dwelling unit it's supposed to be incidental to the principal dwelling unit of the, of the lot or parcel. And so I think in our minds, keeping that connection is important. If you start to sever that, it starts to be in some, some ways two different principal dwelling units. Um, in addition, having that common kind of ownership and operation goes towards keeping it incidental to the principal dwelling unit. Thanks. Any other questions on number five? Mary. So right now, this could happen based under state law where we can't have prohibition. It could happen, and because it's done within the plat, there is no notification to the city that this has happened. So we don't really know if this has happened or not. Right. Is that correct? Um, so if if we were to, is there a way that we could do this and allow the condominiumization um, and with the caveat that the ADU be a permanently affordable unit? Could we do something like that? So probably not, um, and uh, so the, the primary, there's a part of the condominium statute that talks about the condominium form of ownership, and one of the principles that it sets into it in terms of how local governments regulate is that you don't treat a property that is condominiumized different from a property that is not condominiumized, um, and so if you were to say you can go condo if you give us some goodies, you're treating a condominium form of ownership differently than you would treat like the traditional lot and block type ownership. Thank you. Any other questions on change from Rachel? Thanks. Um, I, I, so I think I'm still trying to figure out like what the threat is and why we would want to prohibit this. So if, if I have a house and I put an ADU on it and then I sell the ADU, right, that's the, the loss of common ownership, and, 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 then, and then what? Like, so we've got the lost common ownership. Is the threat that I can then put another ADU on my property because I've gotten rid of that first, or, or what are we protecting against here? I think when the, <coughs> um, kind of the underlying policy rationale of, of how it's structured now is, is that you have an on-site owner always on the property along with the rental property. So the idea is, is that with on-site ownership, uh, I guess the hope would be that you would have more active land management um, and make, you know, making sure that everybody um, um, fits well into the neighborhood. And um, yeah, I think that that's, that's the primary um, public policy rationale for why we group them together. And then I guess the other part is, you know, in terms of how we load the property with occupants, it's 
it's attempted, it's not com completely equal, but it's certainly equivalent to how it would have been occupied even if you didn't have an ADU on the property. So you're just spreading it out a little bit. I just want to ask a follow-up question to Rachel's. Are you done? Um, would, would um, just kind of add on to that, David, would, if we remember we had the type two uh, ADUs, which was the ones that were contractually affordable, would that complicate that contractual relationship with the city if, if, if the ADU could be condominiumized and sold off? I, I don't think so, because okay. if it were condominiumized and sold off, you would still have the covenant. Well, I don't yeah. know that the covenant was on the land, was it? Well, and also, it was about rental rates. Right. Oh, that's right. So, yeah. so I, I think you would lose the affordability, right? Because you would then have an owned property, but yep. the covenant is on the rent. Yep, that's correct. Yeah, that's that's the concern. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Arne. Mary. Mary? Yeah, so that raises a question of, so someone could um, get the extra square footage for an ADU and say that they're gonna make it um, permanently affordable rent-wise and then condominiumize and then we would lose the affordability of it. Yeah, if it's not being rented. Okay. Mark? In a, in a condominium structure, don't you have to create separate tax lots for each property? You have to create separate, uh, under the statute they call them units, and the units can be either two-dimensional or three-dimensional. So could we get to the same place simply by prohibiting subdivision of the property on which both a house and a condominium, uh, rather a house and an ADU is located? Well, that is already prohibited by our zoning for a traditional lot and you know, lot and block type ownership. Um, so this would be basically placing that same restriction that we have for lot and block on a condominium form of ownership. Is the problem that, that state law doesn't doesn't allow us to prohibit condominiumization, is that right? Y yeah, you, uh, yeah, you, condominium, you can, this, the statute allows, um, you know, if you can build it and you've got three dimensional spaces, the condominium act, or the Common Interest Ownership Act um, will allow you to three-dimensionally split it up. Even without a lot split? Even without a? Lot split. Correct. But uh, under our zoning, we would not allow a lot split. Mm -hmm. okay. Did that answer your question? The questions on number, change number five? We'll, never, we'll have another bite at questions, but let's, if, you, if it's okay with you guys, let's go to a public hearing. How many do we have signed up? We have 11. 11. What's our rule? You guys remember? Uh, what, uh, 15. 15? So we're going to go for three minutes each. Are you guys okay with that? So three minutes each, there's 11. You, Eric Bud, you're up first, followed by Charlotte Pitts. Hello. Uh, Eric Budd, uh, I live at Ingram Cooperative. Um, I came here tonight because I was really interested in talking about uh, being able to adopt a changes to the laws that would allow um, housing cooperatives and ADUs to be on the same site. And the way I see this as uh, someone who lives in a cooperative, as someone who is on the board of Boulder Housing Coalition, which uh, provides nonprofits, um, affordable housing in Boulder. You know, we see this as an opportunity to give flexibility to new cooperatives. Um, <clears throat> Lincoln Miller sent an email today talking about how we have two ADUs in our, in our cooperatives today. And <clears throat> when I hear the discussion, and I think there was some really great discussion about this, um, and seeing what the planning board the uh, modifications that they had come up with. Um, I, I really urge you to take the planning board's uh, um, suggestions and allow the uh, cooperatives and ADUs on the same site. You know, as someone who participated a lot in the public process the past four years on cooperatives and ADUs, I know that we came up with a lot of laws, a lot of very detailed, specific, restrictive um, regulations to allow these to happen. And 
the biggest things we did were we restricted the occupancy and we restricted uh, the parking impacts. And so really the, the whole, the whole por por point of this public process was really to reduce the impacts. And what I hear is by putting these two on the same site, um, the impacts are no greater. In fact, you could say it's even more restrictive. Um, if you adopted the idea that the both of the parking regulations would be additive, you know, I think you've got something that's that's uh, really addressing a lot of the concerns um, that we were trying to address in this process, and something that I, I ask to give flexibility. Um, w one other side project I've been working on the past year is. Uh, I started a meetup group of people in Boulder who wanted to start cooperatives. Uh, we started that last February. We've been meeting every month, and it's been really awesome. And after a year, we've created exactly zero cooperatives. And I, I just tell you that story just to, to say, like, it's really hard to do this. Um, it's challenging to make an ADU. It's 10 times more challenging to start a co-op. And just asking you all to consider that and support another way that we can have uh, more affordable housing in Boulder. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Oh, did you have, oh, hold on a second, Eric. Eric, did you have any intention of creating an ADU in the Ingram Court Co-op or some sort of plan to, you know, maybe do it in the future? No, I, I don't think so. Like, um, Boulder Housing Coalition doesn't have any plans. Um, it, it's more just thinking out, outside of the Boulder Housing Coalition, like, and seeing, seeing that we have models in our houses that work and seeing that that could work elsewhere. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Charlotte? After Charlotte Pitts, um, Joshua Merriman. Hi. Um, my name is Charlotte Pitts. I live in Boulder. Um, I'm here to stand before you this evening to express my support for a number of amendments with regards to the ADU design code. Um, firstly, I want to encourage council to support the staff recommendation um, for subsection 964A of ordinance 8372 that removes the architectural provision for existing accessory structures that are subsequently converted into an accessory dwelling unit. The conversion um, of an existing structure into a dwelling space not only removes the potential economic hurdle that comes with new construction costs, but equally important, um, this repurposing process reduces the city's environmental impact. Um, so the foundational idea um, of this proposed change ultimately aligns with Boulder's economic, social, and environmental goals. Um, according to the U.S. Envir Energy Information Administration in 2018, new residential and commercial buildings um, accounted for 40% of the total U.S. energy consumption that year, um, and the carbon emissions within the, in this industry will inevitably continue to rise. So Boulder really does um, have an opportunity here and should therefore work to incentivize the reuse and repurposing of an existing structures and follow through on its commitment towards a more ecologically minded approach to housing strategies. Um, secondly, with regards to the proposed amendments um, to the design standards for new accessory dwelling units, Ordinance 8256, I strongly recommend that Council heeds the concerns of the community to remove the provision requiring that new ADUs be architecturally consistent with the existing structures or adjacent structures. The new, the, um, excuse me. Um, the unnecessarily ambiguous language of the written code ultimately limits the aesthetic of an ADU and therefore the homeowner's right to self-expression. But um, perhaps more importantly, the em economic burden of a rigid aesthetic code can be debilitating for homeowners. Um, and, um, an owner of a brick and mortar residential building would have to clear huge financial hurdles to mimic that style today. Um, and as someone who works in the ADU industry, I understand the ways that these design costs can accrue and potentially derail a project that would have otherwise provided housing for an elderly um, fa familial member um, or would have provided housing to um, um, a person in need of a rental space. So, you know, therefore, if Boulder wants to see, it's, if Boulder seeks to, to make alternative forms of housing possible for different economic groups, um, I urge you at the very least to start by removing these superfluous architectural requirements. And that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. Joshua Merriman. Oh, I'm sorry. Charlotte. Hold on a second, Charlotte. Charlotte, Charlotte. somebody's got a question for you. 
Hi. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. I have, um, you mentioned that you work in the ADU industry. That's and correct. I was wondering um, how many folks have come to you and um, to kind of feel out the situation for whether or not they should build an ADU and they come away going, oh, it's just not going to work. Yeah, um, it, at least almost a dozen um, individuals. A number of people have backed out of projects um, due to um, re restrictions within their neighborhood, so they would have had to get on a waiting list and wait. Um, so that that is one reason, but another reason is, you know, someone who lives in an old, older house, like a stucco home, um, you know, that is of a certain square feet and they're not able to, um, you know, ac accommodate those, you know, architectural requirements as they are currently written in code. Um, similarly with like a modern home, someone who wants to do gables is totally not possible. Um, and then just accrued construction costs can really, um, as I mentioned, just kind of throw us a, a wedge into a project. So yeah, there are many people in Boulder who wanted to use. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Charlotte. Joshua, and uh, followed by Robert Ross. Hello, Council. Hello, everybody in Boulder. Uh, my name is Joshua Merriman. I've lived in Boulder two and a half years or so. Uh, when I first moved here, I worked for uh, VO Mobility Services. Um, I was a bus driver. It was uh, one of my first uh, what I call big boy jobs. I was kind of like, it came from a pretty, pretty low lifestyle. I, I was born to a single mother, didn't have a father figure growing up. And uh, in 2017, I was here in Boulder working for VIA and some unfortunate situation happened with my living situation and I didn't have anywhere to live. I turned to the cold weather shelter and it was a pretty unfortunate situation. I, I held my job through the entire time during all of this. Um, all of my family is in another state in New Mexico. On top of that, I'm probably still, even being on the streets, the most successful person so far, being one of the first people to graduate high school in my family. Uh, whenever I was at the cold weather shelter, they said they'd work with me on, my, on the hours that I'd be available to to get into the place because I had to be to work at 4.30 in the morning for my shift. But you had to be present at 9 a.m. for a coordinated entry in order to be able to be guaranteed a spot in the shelter the fault that same night. So sometimes there was a proper person there who understood my situation who would find a way to make it work for me, but that wasn't always the case. So some nights I'd be a, get a spot, other nights I wouldn't be guaranteed a spot. Those nights I slept underneath the stairs at my job. Um, whenever I was in the shelter, I dealt with crazy amounts of sickness. Uh, I had a lice issue at one point. And as far as right now, I've been in a somewhat stable position in my life. I don't have my own place that I'm on a lease for, but I don't sleep outside and I don't have to sleep in a shelter. Um, at the end of the day, I know there's a huge need for all sorts of crazy amounts of affordable housing, and I, I don't know where to start. It's awesome hearing Eric Budd talking about, you know, the new ADU. I remember meeting him when he was running for office a couple of years ago when I was first fired up in this arena. Um, but I just wanted to share my story. That's really it. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks for sharing. We're going to close the sign up for the uh, public hearing. Uh, next is um, Robert Ross and then uh, David Adamson. Hi, Robert Ross, 2605 Mapleton. Um, I'm an architect here in Boulder and I wanted to discuss the subjective language related to architectural design uh, for detached ADUs, which states architectural design shall be consistent with the existing residents on the site or the adjacent buildings along the side of the yards a lot. The planning board unanimously approved having this language and I support that decision. Uh, when the planning board discussed this, it was noted that yes, this language is a carryover from the original ADU regulations, but it was stated that 
Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good code. Um, in fact, it is a piece of code that many, if not most, homeowners or design professionals even really knew about uh, until the adoption last February when ADU sort of came on a lot more people's radar and they started approaching us. Um, so how can something so subjective be fairly or equitably reviewed by staff? You know, outside of historic districts, staff does not really review or regulate design for new homes, additions, accessory buildings. Um, why for an ADU only? So uh, if maintaining compatibility is the goal, this approach seems short-sighted, really, as neighborhoods have and always will change over time. Uh, we should consider the existing housing stock. Is there a reason that split-level homes or brick ranches repeated down the block are not what inspires homeowners uh, or those of us in the design profession when designing something new? People want something they can make their own, uh, which is evident when you see the remodels throughout the city. Most of our neighborhoods are already an eclectic mix of architectural styles. It makes for streetscapes that people, streetscapes that people talk about, makes for a ex more exciting built environment. When I walk down the alleys in our neighborhoods, uh, the architecture often does inspire, or at least me, uh, the variety of character from historic garages and modern accessory buildings to funky sheds or DIY chicken coops. Our backyards and alleys have always been a place for beautiful and experimental architecture. Uh, building small often frees up resources or opportunities to do something different, something unique. Um, I believe that any reference to this architectural design should be struck entirely from this ordinance, uh, as it doesn't really have a place in the regulation of our backyards. I would like to add, as somebody who works with staff and planning and, and these guys a lot, they do a great job. They have a really full plate. And if there's like one little thing that, from my perspective, could maybe make their job a little easier would be to take a regulation like this that's subjective and hard, <coughs> you get pushback on, it, it, there'd probably be value in uh, making their life uh, a little better, as well as those who try to present this to them. Thank you. Great, thanks Robert. Yeah. David Adamson, and then can you scroll forward to see who's next? Lincoln Miller after David. David Adamson, 815 North Street, and the Executive Director of Goose Creek Community Land Trust, and um, one of the expert co-op housing organizations. And I want to welcome our new members, and I want to thank you all for our service, including our fine staff. I believe I want to speak specifically about the um, co-op, uh, allowing ADUs along with co-ops especially. And I think this issue was surfaced in our pre-app with Carl, where in our attempts to add um, more middle-income housing to North Street as a part of our gentle infill that we're trying to do there, um, we, we wanted to make sure in our MEX-1 that we could have a, a co-op, have an ADU as part of a co-op if we decided to, to develop that. And he said it's likely, but it, it seems like there's been an oversight here. So, and it could get changed after people get concerned about it. So I just want to address this issue as a developer and to follow up on Eric Budd's point, which is, you know, we haven't had many co-ops. It's a hard thing to do. We want the market to uptake this and do a lot more of these. We spent a lot of time in the city tr trying to allow this. And this, I, I just don't understand. Why would we prohibit this? There's no occupancy um, impact to this. It only makes it less likely to have families to have diverse, you know, more diversity in the city. And, um, you know, we're seeing that <coughs> in our attempts to work with Eric to create more co-ops in town. We see a lot of wonderful interest in co-ops by seniors, by families, but, but they like the idea of having some more, uh, maybe some more privacy. You know, it it's, would be so great to have a family to be in ADU, in the back. You know, that's where they're members of the co-op, but they have a little more private space there. So that really opens it up to families. It really opens it up to different kind of living groups. It just provides flexibility. So I just want to uh, really, this is a new council. This is a new time. We have an urgent housing crisis in this city urgent. This is a beautiful way that the city of Boulder developed to try to create more housing. So a vote, I'm, I'm sorry, I love the staff, but a vote for this staff recommendation is a vote against families, against affordability, against diversity. I just don't understand why we would do that. There's no good reason 
cleaning up the code is great, yes, but um, it can easily be cleaned up in a way that promotes affordability and diversity. So I just am passing out a little bit of a point about how we're really going backwards on affordable housing in general because we have all this McMansion development. And so I hope for the retreat you can consider these ideas that were uh, uh, pro provided two years ago. Thank you so much for your service again. Thank you, David. Lincoln Miller. Sorry, my boy. It's okay, David. Lincoln Miller followed by uh, Mark Gilband. Good evening, Lincoln Miller, 2711 Mapleton. Uh, I'm also on staff for your uh, expert cooperative housing organization, or ECHO. Uh, David is on the other one. Um, so I just wanna clarify on the existing ADUs in the co-ops that we have. They're not using the ADU ordinance, they are functional ADUs, meaning they are a detached cottage and to attached apartments. What they've done beautifully is provide permanently affordable housing to low-income families. Uh, a lot of single parents want to live in uh, ADU-like structures within co-ops, and we've seen that over 25 combined years. So. Um, I really want to encourage you to adopt and look at the planning board recommendations. Um, it's very important as a housing developer that's trying to do affordable cooperatives that we have options. It's very difficult to do development, so allowing us to do development with ADUs and keeping those properties on the table that have ADUs can be very powerful for potentially providing future affordable housing. I guess the other thing I want to say is in the six years of political work that it took to get the co-op ordinance passed, during that time land values pushed the price of single family homes further and further, higher and higher away from us. So that now, even with public subsidy, it's very difficult to use the co-op ordinance to do permanently affordable housing. This is going to continue. Uh, and what we're looking at is a potential nightmare scenario where every single family home in this city is a 7,000 square foot mansion haunted by a very wealthy retired couple. Like that's what the market is pushing. We need every possible creative solution that we can come up with. ADUs and co-ops are one very small example. Let's be bold when it takes 45 minutes to explain our simplified ADU ordinance, that's not what bold looks like. What, with Portland, you can go to their planning department and you can get off the shelf pre-approved ADU building plans. Yes, pre-approved and they're affordable. Contrast that with the Kafka-esque experience that is our planning department. <laughs> uh, and you'll see what a bold action looks like. Again, in California, the entire state, two ADUs per property in the entire state. That's what bold action on affordable housing looks like. I encourage you to take those actions. Thanks, Lincoln. Mark Gelban followed by Eli McCutcheon. Good evening all, Mark Gelban, 505 College. Um, when the ADU ordinance was passed, Sam said, we've just done something with radical, we've created radical flexibility. That's a joke. It's just heard by Lincoln gave some examples of what radical flexibility looks like. And I would say that's not even that radical. But I also want to echo something that Lincoln said and that this council should come to grips with, as should this community, that our built environment all the big mansions that we've seen built, that I've seen built in the 30 years that I've been here, are a reflection of slow growth controlled councils and the policies that we've created. That is what this council and councils previous have incentivized. And uniformly, people say they're against that, and I'd ask everybody here, as I look out my neighborhood window, I see 10 houses with about 
40,000 square feet and about 30 empty bedrooms housed by couples, wealthy retired couples. Is that sustainable or encouraging people to build smaller homes, whether it's a condoized ADU, whether it's eliminating a Victorian occupancy limit so someone like me could, you know, put three uh, renters in my house now that three kids are gone and gone off to college? So think about that. What we have, the built environment we have, are a reflection of the rules that we have in the book. We're trying to add equally as restrictive rules when it comes to ADUs. And then I want to just speak for a minute about legal non-conforming and the fact that you added legal non-conforming buildings to the 20% the calculation. One, that legal non-conforming calculation is inaccurate on the city's maps. Um, non-conforming buildings as of solar ordinance and as of um, uh, compatible development have not been updated or added or not accurately reflected. And then I also just want to say, in my subdivision, the Vermont subdivision, where out my window I see 10 homes, 40,000 square feet, 30 empty bedrooms, more than half of the homes are duplexes, triplexes, eightplexes. They are all legal non-conforming. Let me tell you what that means. It means they were there before all the single-family homeowners, and the one in particular who spoke to get this passed, Miss Lisa Spaulding, were there before she showed up on the scene. They're there because density was built there. They're there in Whittier because that's where density exists already. They are there on the hill because that's where we need density. So instead of including those areas, we need to get rid, one, we need to get rid of that 20% anyway, but legal non-conforming means that was the character of the neighborhood before the huge single family home showed up. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, Eli? And then uh, Claudia? Hello. Uh, my name is Eli McCutcheon, and I am a local born and raised to Boulderite. And um, I lived in a couple other parts of Colorado for the majority of the last 10 years, but on coming back, I was really surprised at how limited the options were for living here um, for people that weren't already in Boulder. Um, and ADUs in particular are something that I'm really, really interested in because like people have echoed before, it's one of the best ways to make affordable living possible. At a, at a quality of life that is something that most people would want. A lot of the co-ops, um, I am also the most recent member of the Chrysalis co-op co community, um, and we have 14 people there in one house, which is a lot of people in a very small house. And that's okay for people you know, like me who are single and you know, not necessarily planning on starting a family in the next five or so years. Mm -hmm. Um, but if I were a single parent or if I had a family, co-op living wouldn't really be possible uh, or at least comfortable. And the ADUs are a way that, that small families could potentially have a quality living situation within a co-op. So um, I think the, the main fears around the ADU that might have led to this coming up, uh, this proposal coming up, are the increased occupancy and increased parking problems, which as other people have already said would not be an issue um, with the ADUs and co-ops because they would already be included into the occupancy for, um, for the co-ops. So yes, that's all I have to say. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Eli. Claudia? After Claudia, Lynn Siegel. Good evening, members of council. Claudia Hansen theme. I live in Boulder, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Boulder Community Housing Association, which some of you know as BOCHA, which is a group founded in 2013 to support and advocate for diverse forms of community living in Boulder. Members of BOCHA were surprised to see language related to co-ops amongst the suggested revisions to this ADU ordinance, and we were disappointed that staff um, even after a long and constructive conversation with the planning board continues to support additional restrictions on these forms of housing that, as you've heard, support so many of Boulder's housing goals. The staff memo suggested that co-located co-ops and ADUs would generate additional impacts to neighborhoods that were not intended. Um, and to be honest, our group is not sure what those impacts could be. 
We don't think there's anything about allowing an ADU on a property that necessarily overrides elements of the co-op ordinance that were put in place precisely to safeguard and reassure neighbors. Co-op occupancy limits are set at 12 persons in low density residential zones, and we see no reason that adding an ADU would change that limit. It simply changes how people are distributed on an existing lot. And the co-op ordinance also mandates strict limits on resident parking. Regardless of size, co-ops must limit their on-street parking to three cars, and again, this requirement would not change with the presence of an ADU. We know that occupancy limits and parking were major concerns in the community, and a lot of process went into addressing those in both the co-op and ADU um, ordinances. And we actually don't see how combining co-ops and ADUs would change those impacts. Meanwhile, we think there are good reasons to allow these types of housing together. First, doing so would expand the number of properties available for community living. Only a small fraction of Boulder homes are suitable for co-op occupation, so including homes with ADUs preserves flexibility for people trying to organize them, as Eric spoke to. A second benefit of co-op and ADU combinations, and this one is quite personal for me, is that semi-private living actually opens up shared housing to a broader cross-section of our community. Currently living in a co-op house requires an intense commitment to sharing space and it typically attracts young adults, single people, and others who are comfortable in group settings. But the economic and social benefits of community living are also attractive to families with children, older adults, and people who simply desire more privacy in their, AD, in their day-to-day lives. ADUs can provide this option for them. At its November 21st meeting, Planning Board largely supported our reasoning. Um, with no identifiable negative consequences to allowing co-ops co and ADUs together. And so we hope that you will take a look at attachment B in the memo before you. We appreciate the efforts of planning board to get that in front of you and hope that you will allow co-ops and ADUs together in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Lynn Siegel, and after Lynn, Kurt Norvac. Um, Lynn Siegel. Um, in my situation personally with ADU, I've already put 30,000 bucks into one, but I don't want to throw more money at it um, because I was deactivated from Airbnb and that's the only way I can get housemates. And I don't join with the co-op people and get co-op communities. I get people by, they're staying in my house, they're coming here maybe temporarily and not this is not short term, Airbnb is not short term, it's just a way to get people in your house. When I started in 2012, um, I was doing Craigslist and now Craigslist is impossible. Nothing, zero you get from Craigslist, scams. Um, and um, I'll just live in my place, 2,600 square feet with nobody, that's okay, you know, and that's the way I'll live if I have to but I need something that encourages me. And I don't know if this was partly, I got deactivated from Airbnb also, possibly because of City of Boulder issues. Um, I know there was a lot of stress um, that might have you know, translated to Airbnb um, in the way they run their system, but I support Airbnb for the ADU and the main house. It's kind of none of the city's business. If I had my way, I'd do it in my, I mean, I can't do Airbnb, so it's useless for me, but if I had it in my main house, I wouldn't really worry about it too much, having it with the ADU, because I'd have people coming through my main house and I can screen them for the ADU. But um, as far as parking issues, um, there's 34 parking spots for the same amount of seniors at Foo Hafs as there are um, 304 parking spots for the same amount of seniors at 311. To me, there's a parking problem here. If we're quibbling over parking here and there, you know, how can, how can we be building this massive amount of housing? I, I mean, how, parking, because how, parking is a direct assault on housing. You know, each flood is worth 200,000 bucks. You know, like I was saying, and you know, how many people in China are living in the size of one's parking space? Um, so it's a very big deal. And w when Boulder has the hypocrisy of 304 parking spaces at 311 and 34 at Foo Hafs, we've got problems. Um, as far as the design, I kind of like the same design in the neighborhood a little bit, but 
Um, on the other hand, if you have a house with a weird design, you know, a rogue house, and it goes out, then do you have to design that to your ADU and your ADU to that? Um, I could kind of see the points of the pe people with eclecticness. Um, as far as separating f directly, you know, a separate unit, and people can buy that separately, I can also see the kind of problems that there might be with you having more people with different interests, whereas you have one person on the property that's kind of, Excellent. you know, watching over like what happens in the neighborhood, and maybe that would temper things a bit. Thank you, Lynn. Kurt, followed by Marta. Hi, Kurt Nordback, 777 Delwood Avenue, Boulder. Staff have struggled to explain the justification for their proposals regarding the combination of co-ops and ADUs and condoization of properties with market rate ADUs. The proposals seem designed to mm -hmm. avoid imaginary harms while creating actual measurable harms. I'm the treasurer of Boulder Housing Coalition, so the success of co-ops is critical to me. Others have pointed out that staff's proposal regarding co-ops could pose an, an additional hurdle to creating a co-op. Ad uh, allowing ADUs at co-ops, on the other hand, would provide a form, uh, a form of housing that could be particularly appealing to small families and older residents who might otherwise be less able to partake of the financial and community benefits of co-op living. Staff have said that we need additional public process on this change, but there has been con uh, considerable public input already as the proposal came to planning board and now before you. Moreover, if additional public process is justified to allow the combination of co-ops and ADUs, then logically additional public process should be justified to prohibit them. Regarding conduization, the middle income housing strategy identified home ownership as the biggest hurdle for middle income residents, more of a hurdle than renting. Allowing properties with market rate ADUs to be conduized would provide a unique home ownership opportunity for folks who want to live a lower carbon life in a smaller, more efficient, and more affordable home. The concerns about loss of affordable ADUs are valid, but could be addressed by restricting sale price, as is done with other forms of affordable housing in Boulder. Please allow co-ops to have ADUs and allow condoization of properties with ADUs. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Marta? Good evening, Council and, and Boulder. My name is Martha Loach. I mean, I live in Longmont. I'm currently running for Boulder County Commissioner. My background from a career standpoint is as a housing advocate. Over the last 20 years, I have been working on these issues of accessibility, of making sure that all residents who live in the US, in the state of Colorado, and in Boulder County have access to, as long as they can qualify for a mortgage, to a mortgage product, which means docket, means I tenant, means everybody. Um, so this topic is super fascinating to me for two reasons. One, an hour and a half ago or so, I'm not sure what time it is now, we were here talking about a policy of emergency shelter affecting folks who are experiencing homelessness in the city of Boulder. And then we're also having a conversation community-wide about the fact that housing stability and safety is really where our community members can start to even address of the other issues that are that everybody is facing. So one of my piece, one of my questions here is why would we not open our arms and be dynamic in the city of Boulder to opportunities that will give people access to housing? This idea of being, I heard what Rachel said about what is it exactly that we're trying to protect ourselves from. Um, two pieces, from a housing industry standpoint, a condominium is typically the first way that somebody accesses home ownership. When we talk about home ownership, not just in the city of Boulder, not just in the county, but from a national perspective, uh, uh, owning a home is the way to build generational wealth. It is the way to invest in your community, and I've seen families over the last 20 years go from moving, 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 myself included, into being able to own a home, and I've seen kids' lives completely change when they become part of their community and start 
knowing their neighbors and start going to parks and activities and get more involved in their schools. So there's a piece that from my perspective from a housing background is why wouldn't we invest in our community and open up all of these different creative opportunities to create more accessibility. We know we have an affordable housing issue in the city of Boulder. And so the change five, I believe it was called, um, to give that opportunity for someone to condoize a property, an ADU, is an excellent opportunity. What folks may not understand is that the reason why we have so little condo inventory around the state of Colorado is actually a legislative issue. And so that's why there was a complete stop on the building of condos. But that was truly, for a lot of people, the one way to start investing and start having home ownership and start building into our communities. So I would encourage you all to look at it very seriously Martin, and very closely. Leave, I think, um, got a question. Yeah, um, would you be okay with losing a permanently affordable rental by someone coming in and condoizing one of those that was built? Um, what I heard from this conversation right now was that there wasn't any structure set up that would make an ADU uh, permanently affordable property, in which case I'm not sure how we would lose a permanently affordable property that wasn't um, set up to be that to be able to give an opportunity for somebody to Correct, own. I'm just asking, since there is the option that someone builds a permanently affordable rental that's actually bigger than a general ADU, and then someone comes in and condoizes it, that is a potential if we allow condoization. The other piece that we may wanna look into from uh, an industry piece is that the word condo, I think maybe has a misinterpretation and a perception, because we actually have condos that aren't, I think, what people are interpreting. So there is a way to pull in our the lot and block piece to make a condo that's not the traditional condo that you're talking about. That might be an alternative as well. Thank you. Thank you. Let's close the public hearing and uh, return to council for final questions, and then we'll maybe do a bit of straw polling on the um, the various um, changes and maybe cobble together a resolution. Any follow up questions, Aaron, and then Rachel. So on the the condominium, <coughs> I can't even say the word, the condo option. Um, would it be possible for us to outlaw the condo approach for the type two ADUs only? I, I, don't, being the I don't think ones. so. What's up? I don't think so because you would be treating the condominium, you would be treating the condominium form of ownership differently. Well, we wouldn't be prohibiting condoization in general. We'd be saying you could do them to some things and not others, and you're saying that would be. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds like, so, you know, I think that the Common Interest Ownership Act says if you build a space, you should be able to divide it up kind of however you want to. And if the, if the local government has building requirements, it has to treat that box basically the same as it would treat it with a tr more traditional form of ownership. You cannot treat the condominium form of ownership differently from a regulatory perspective. It, so can you show us the attachment C again? If you wouldn't mind. Yes, not, not as a lawyer. It's, it, we're, here we're saying you can't sell an ADU independently for the principal jailing unit, and you're saying we couldn't distinguish which kinds of ADUs we would prohibit from being sold independently? I don't know, it just seems like it might not be caught up in what you're talking about. Well, I'll, I'll take a look at what's in the existing code. Okay. Well, David's doing that, Rachel. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm confused by the, um, you know, the only thing that I see as a threat would be, as Adam suggested, the loss of affordable units. Um, but right now, if I get an, an exemption and, and go into Category 2 and can build more square footage in an ADU, do I ever have to rent that out to begin with? No, you don't have to. So, it, I mean, it may be that we, I don't know how many affordable units we have in the program right now and how many are being rented out, and it doesn't sound like any, um, this, we don't think this has happened at all to begin with, so I, 
I guess I'm still confused as to like if there's a real threat that we're looking at and if there's a real possibility of losing affordable housing. And I'm, I'm hopeful that Aaron's also on the right track that we can maybe um, prohibit that somehow. And again, just the motivation behind attachment C is just that the general intent of the ADU regs even going back more than 20 years has been that it be an accessory unit and that it have some own, owner oversight, you know, in a rental situation. I think that, so we were, again, coming at it from that approach and that if it becomes its own ownership entity, then that might be in co conflict with that. It would still though have an owner, like the new owner presumably also wants to get along with the neighborhood and, and keep the, I mean, it's not an automatic rental in that situation, right? It's got a new owner mm -hmm. who may well live there affordably. Yeah, I mean, they could. It's just, again, you know, it's, it's an accessory unit. So it, when you allow a sale of that unit, it, it's more of a, just a principal dwelling unit on the property. Thank you. Mary? So just to follow on that, so what you're saying is that if the condoization, I'll leave out the middle letters, um, um, does away with the, the principal, or it makes the ADU a principal dwelling unit, um, effectively what you've done is subdivide. Is that? Yeah. I think so. so maybe there's something there <laughs> that can be. Let me ask a follow-up question. Um, when, when we approve an ADU and, and it complies with all the rules, we, we grant, a, we the city grant a license to the principal property owner, right? Permitting that ADU and as long as they, they stay in compliance as far as occupancy and parking and all the other requirements, the license continues. And if they were in violation of the, the owned, the property owner was in violation of the license, we would have the right to withdraw that license mm -hmm. and they'd no longer be allowed to have an ADU there. If the ADU could be sold off as a separate <coughs> unit, where would, the license would still be with the original property owner, right? How, how would you enforce, let's say that the, the, the new owner of the, the new, now owner, not, the, not they went gone from a tenant to an owner, violated one of the rules, the you know, occupancy rule, for example, or, or something like that, um, what recourse would you have against, um, for that violation? Because you now have a license that's been issued to a property owner, but he doesn't care about the ADU because he's already sold it out, he's got his money, right? What, what would be the recourse against that ADU owner? I don't, I don't see that from a practical perspective that you would have any kind of real property kind of remedy because I, d I don't see us kicking somebody out of a home that they own. <laughs> um, so, you know, the remedy that you would have, it would be like zoning enforcement. So, for example, um, you know, if somebody were gonna, it would be complicated. If somebody were to condo an ADU off of the main unit, um, as you, mentioned, they're still subject to the original approval. So, but you don't have that unified ownership to kind of manage the permit. You have two people managing the permit. So it just adds another kind of level of complexity with how you would regulate. Um, and, you know, so, you know, kind of like the owner occupancy, if they both rented it out, you know, do you lose that kind of on-site? How do they, how do the two people that own it agree who's gonna be the on-site person versus um, the rental rental unit. Um, I don't see those as insurmountable problems, but they're just complicating issues, I think. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Discussion. Okay, let's just, um, I, I'm gonna suggest that we, we discuss these change by change, and maybe as we discuss them, maybe wrap up our discussions with a little bit of um, straw polling, and then de depending on wh where we end up, we can figure out, you know, attachments are, um, are relevant. Is that okay we with you guys? Do have a, a holistic option slide, if you, or we could go by the individual. I'd say that I found that more confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you guys want to go off that, that's fine. But we may end up doing something that's not up there. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a possibility, right? Change by change. 
Yeah, so if you don't mind, thanks for doing that, but mm -hmm. maybe we can just go change by change. Okay. And then yes. just to follow up on Aaron's question, if you were to just break out the affordable units, I think you could do that without violating the statute. So let's let's do. Can you scroll forward a little bit further? So, I just want to understand what David just said. So you're saying that you would not allow condominiumization of those properties that have the type two. Yeah. Yeah. So you would, um, you know, you would tie it back to the affordable accessory units regulation in the code and you would apply it across the board to all of those units and you would just say rather than um, no condominiumization, it would be no condominiumization of that type of unit. It would, uh, s the same rule applies to, um, you know, under our existing zoning in that we would not allow it to be split off. So it, it does seem like you would be treating it the same under both scenarios. Great, when, when we get there, we can talk about it. Okay, good. So let's take change one. Any first, any comments, strong feelings? Um, Mark, you want to say something? Uh, on, on the roof pitch issue, this seems to be relatively de minimis in impact, mm -hmm. and if it keeps uh, property owners from having to go to through extensive and expensive modifications of their home that exists, uh, I'm just not sure that it, it's worth the candle to <coughs> to require that. The, you know, the existing roof pitch. Okay. People tend to agree with Mark. Anybody disagree? Okay. <coughs> Thanks for leading us on that, Mark. Number two. So there are two choices here. Comments or statements? I found the, the heinous house argument. <laughs> to the heinous house <laughs> argument is hard to, to go against. Go for Thanks. You know, Rachel, that'll be the headline in Dawson's <laughs> paper, right? <laughs> Council allows heinous house or non exceptions non-competitively. <laughs> Anybody? Um, so the, the, I, I, are we leaning towards, Mark, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I am uh, more supportive of keeping the risk, the, uh, architectural design requirements for new construction, but I would like to ensure that there's some sort of reasonable application of it, so that yes, if you have a brick and, and mortar home, you don't require an ADU to be built out of brick. I mean, there are, and there are really two standards. One is consistency with the house, and two is consistency with what's going on in the neighborhood, and, and maybe the neighborhood is a little different and gives you a little greater flexibility um, to approve. Um, but I don't, I don't think abandoning all architectural design requirements is, is really a good thing. Maybe one of you who have served in the planning board can speak about compatibility that requirements that would still be in place. <laughs> or maybe the staff wants to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, well, they're, they're a little subjective, I think. But. Well, one of the things that um, comes to my mind and in, in trying to think this through right now is that when you're talking about adjacency and adjacency, that was one of my questions that got answered during the discussion, adjacency includes um, the homes in the adjacent property. So if you live um, on an alley, so you, you would have one to your left and to your right adjacency and you would also have adjacency to the rear of you. So as time would um, march on, you would probably get changes from adjacencies. So I, I guess I'm right now, I, I need to listen to more discussion because I'm kind of on the fence. Karen? Oh, well, I just, I think it's, it's a staff level review and I think they do their best to, to look at context and, and I don't think they're super strict about it, but at the same time they, they do require some level of consistency. So it, it is, you know, somewhat subjective. It's not just your home, it's also other people's homes that are near you, which to me can, seems like it might be a little onerous to have to comply with the appearance of neighboring houses that aren't yours and you might not even like. Mark? But wouldn't that in effect be liberating in the sense that if you've got four homes surrounding you, you can be consistent with any one of them, 
not consistent with all of them, but just something that's relatively compatible, you know, with a sort of a rule of reason applied to the application. Um, not trying to get uh, homeowners to have to mimic any particular style, but something that just uh, flows with the rest of the neighborhood. Not every property in the neighborhood, but at least one. Uh, Rachel? Could there also be um, an environmental aspect to it? So if I'm complying with something that was built, if all, if all four houses, including mine and the ones near me, are 50 years old and, and they're conforming to a, a less, you know, climate friendly type of building structure, then we are requiring people to do not the most innovative and resilient builds. I think you'd still be bound by the building code, energy code. Any staff comment or do we could move to Adam? Yeah, it would be subject to our, our energy code. I don't think that we apply it that rigidly that it would, we would say, oh, you have to do a substandard design. <laughs> um, I think it is applied reasonably, but I don't think that we apply the criterion strict enough that you get like a Frankenstein building that borrows from the four structures around <laughs> it. It's not like that. Okay, Adam. I'm looking at a 7-0 planning decision here, so I think it takes a pretty strong argument to overturn that mm -hmm. and throw that out there. So that, that's an argument in favor of it has to be? Correct. Okay. Oh, and okay. I, I will note that, that the planning board does have a diversity of opinions for it sure. It does, I agree. They, yeah. they often disagree on things. Okay, I'm kind of in the boat as Mark is in terms of, I think that I don't know if there's been enough community discussion in terms of if you understand what your neighbors are going to be putting up, so to at least have some kind of, I don't obviously want a Frankenstein-esque house, but if a bunch of the neighbors on the block don't understand what's going up and it's all of a sudden some super modern thing when then you have more classic looking homes, and now there's another building like that, I think at least having something somewhat of a semblance of how the neighborhood is would be nice. So that's a vote for A, it sounds like, is that? Okay. Anybody else wanna weigh in between A and B? Sounds like we've got some divergence of opinion. Okay, no comments. Well, let's just do a little quick straw poll here. How many are attachment A? Sounds like we got two, and are the rest of you for attachment B? Okay, sounds like we're leaning towards B on that one. Okay. One to three. This is the sexy one, okay. Can we have an A versus B? Comments or arguments in favor of one or the other? Go ahead, Mark. You know, this change may be entirely benign and it may even be positive, but I have no idea. I mean, there's been very little analysis uh, you know, we're talking about relatively new ordinances. Staff hasn't come back with a, um, a review of how these ordinances have worked over time. Um, this may be fine, but I, I just think it's a little premature from a process point of view to be going in this direction. Frankly, either one. Um, I would, I would, if I had to vote, I'd probably vote for attachment A only because it maintains a status quo, but I'd, I'd want to make it subject to review. Um, and I would have staff look at it, and say, you know, come back and say, look, this is, this is much ado about nothing. Or if it's not, I'd like to understand why. Okay. Arguments in agreement with Mark or in opposition to Mark's position? Rachel? Oh, I'm sorry, Ginny. Rachel, then Judy. So I, I'd go for attachment B, and, and I would say actually that I, I disagree about um, it being slow if we prohibit it, because right now the status quo is it's not prohibited or allowed. So I think um, either one of these is probably a change to the status quo, and we should recognize that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm particularly swayed by the um, affordability for families, and I uh, I would echo Adam's point that this was a 7-0 planning board recommendation, and that is a pretty uh, diverse viewpoint board, um, and they, they did have some public process when they considered it. Thanks, Judy. <coughs> Thank you. I think for me as well, it's a no-brainer. 
that be. And I'm sure, you know, the staff has a lot of expertise, but I think it, to me, it goes back to values, right? What do we value in our own community? And protecting families and ensuring that people have a place to stay should be at the forefront of the policies that we put forward. So to me, B makes sense. And I don't think tonight it's really about public process, because if it is, we can still vote on B and still put this caveat of public process. So we shouldn't just prohibit things and say, okay, uh, because we didn't have as much public process into it, then we should just vote no. So I think for me, I think B is the more humane alternative. Thank you. I think we had um, Aaron then, and then Adam. Yeah, uh, I absolutely agree with um, Junie. Thanks for those comments. She was, uh, was very insightful. And I, I think that there, there were some potential um, uh, things to be figured out between allowing ADUs and co-ops, like how would they interact? And I thought the planning board did a great job of uh, figuring out where the potential uh, discrepancies or conflicts might be and then clarifying them. So I think they've given us a great thing that we could adopt, that planning board did unanimously, but I'm particularly swayed by um, some of the, the testimony and emails that we've got that uh, I don't see any additional impacts from this um, because you have the same parking requirements as you had before, you have the same occupancy limits as you had before. Instead, there's only the opportunity for more housing flexibility and allowing folks, say, um, uh, single parents or, or folks in uh, multi-generational uh, families to, to live together in a co-op. So I think it's, it's, I don't know how many of them there'll be, but it seems like uh, an, a harmless thing, but might help. Okay, Adam. So for this one, um, there are seven, seven of our co-ops or rentals. That's the number I heard, correct? Eight, I think. Eight. Seven of the, seven of the eight are rentals. One. Right. So the likelihood of anyone building one of these in any short amount of time is very small. We have no co-ops in the pipeline. There's just not that much that's going to change currently with this rule in place if we went with B. The only part that I'm gonna play devil's advocate with is the final sentence, the co-op with an ADU would only count once in any requisite saturation calculation. That's not necessarily gonna sway my vote, but I think it is worth thinking about slightly just because that's changing saturation. Saturation is something we just decided on to some degree. Um, but again, maybe seven at most currently are gonna be affected by this. Not a, it's not enough to argue about too much in my mind. I mean, that last point will just clarify that, that that's basically keeping it as it is now. We just wanted to make it really clear in the code that it wouldn't double count. That, that's why we propose that new language. Because each, each of those have, co-ops have saturation limits and ADUs have saturation limits. And what you're saying is, is you, you would just count that time, right? That's right. Okay. So there still would be a saturation limit, it'd just be the... I think Mary was next. Yeah, what Adam said. Uh, I'm particularly swayed by the, the planning board 7-0 vote and, and the fact that there is a diversity of opinions there and oftentimes people that don't agree. So um, that has large sway and also the fact that two years, um, after two years of um, deliberation on the co-op ordinance, we've only seen eight co-ops. Um, so I, you know, to Mark's earlier point, it seems like this would be pretty benign. Mirabai, do you wanna weigh in? I'm on for B. On for B. I'm gonna declare for B also. Um, you know, I, I think Mark raises a good point about um, there, there could be a hybrid between A and B that provides for some sort of administrative review, but. Um, as Lincoln reminded us, um, co-ops uh, involve a ton of review as it is right now, and I think there is a pretty in-depth analysis by staff that, that happens in this. And so I staff saw something in a co-op application that happened to have an ADU built into it, I guess, as they would flag it for reasons unrelated to the ADU. <laughs> I also want to remind us um, that to, to um, particularly with respect to attached ADUs or internal ADUs, all it requires is basically like a stove and a refrigerator and suddenly you've got an ADU. I mean, half of us probably have ADUs technically in our basements right now. And um, I, I think Claudia made a really good point, or somebody made a really good, several of you made good points about 
you know, having co-ops that are family friendly so that you can kind of um, section off a part of the co-op and have a separate refrigerator and bathroom and, and, and stove. The occupancy being seven in co-ops, that's not my rec recollection. Could you refresh uh, my memory on that? I believe it's 12, right? I think it's 12 up to 15. 12 up to 15, depending upon the zoning district um, that you're in. Okay, thank you. That's, that's more my recollection. So I heard a lot of Bs. Do we want to do straw poll, or do those who are support A? No, my uh, colleague Adam has convinced me. Okay, so it sounds like we're kind of all on Bs. Great. Um, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Remember, I, you were on a B, right? I was on a B. Okay. Oh, you were B. Okay. Okay, great. Number four. Any um, opposition to this one? Language cleanup? Okay, good. Number five. Okay, somebody want to speak in favor of or against this one? All right. <laughs> Since yeah. I'm going to be the outlier on these things, um, reading some of the literature and, and actually some of the emails um, discussing this, I don't think this is much more than an opportunity for a property owner to enhance the value of his property. I don't think it's contributory to creating more affordable housing. Um, it's simply a, an opportunity to put an ADU on your property, condominiumize the entirety, um, and then, you know, for four or $500,000, sell off the ADU. I don't know what it's going to do for us. Um, and if the objectives are to create more affordable housing, um, I, don't, I don't know how many uh, people are going to want to live in a 600 square foot home that's going to cost them three hundred fifty to four hundred fifty thousand dollars so to me, at the end of the day, this is, this is mostly a boon to the property owner uh, and doesn't do much for me in terms of um, the larger housing policies. So you'd be in favor of attachment C? I would be in favor, yes. Okay. Others in favor of attachment C? We're opposed to, go ahead. So for this, um, in my mind, I do want to prevent someone going with a second option on an ADU and then having a much bigger ADU and no parking requirement and condoizing their unit, I think that's something that needs to be avoided. Um, also, I don't like the idea of making things even more complicated when it comes to um, a house being a, assigned an ADU, essentially. So that's it's a two-pronged thing for me that I'm more interested in attachment C. Okay, everybody? I'm with Mark and keeping the affordability. We may have some opposition to attachment C, so I'll just weigh in. I'm also in favor of attachment C for the reasons that, that Mark and Adam have stated. Aaron? Yeah, so I, I really, uh, as, as Adam put it, I really don't want to lose the uh, uh, affordable, the potential affordable rental on the ADU, so I would absolutely want to um, prohibit that. I, I found uh, Marta's testimony to be uh, fairly compelling about the potential for a small condo as an intro to home ownership for folks. So um, I, I don't feel super strongly about this, but I, I thought potentially the idea of uh, disallowing it for the type twos only uh, was interesting. So if anybody else was interested in that, I'd be up for the discussion. Rachel, I saw Rachel first. Okay, yeah, go ahead, yeah. I have a question. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, agree with, Aaron, that I would like to preserve the affordable, and I think that's what Adam was getting at maybe as well, that if we can um, eliminate the possibility of getting the extra square footage and then selling and, and profiting off of that, but actually keep that uh, as available affordable rental or affordable ADU units, and if we can exempt that, which I think I heard that that's on the table as an option. Yes. Yes. So I, I would be in favor of that, I think. Okay. Mary, you had a question? Um, yeah, I did, but I've forgotten what it was. Okay. Junie has something to say while you're thinking about it. Yeah, I, I was just a little bit confused what Rachel just said, but I think for me as well, it goes back to equity, this sense of equity. And I'm thinking if really we want to build affordable housing, we have to go it through it through the right processes and ensuring that, you know, however the development process goes when it comes to creating affordable housing. And I can imagine as well, as Mark mentioned, that you know someone with a huge property decide, okay, I'm gonna build an AD ADU and just wait a little while, however that process go, and just sell it to someone for a really large amount of money. So I think 
again, we have to think about what are we trying to avoid and what we really want to do. Mary, do you? Yeah, and I don't think that, I think this one just requires a little more um, thought if we want to do it. And I would just go with attachment C for now. And, um, and what I'm thinking is that more than likely, if we're able to um, cordon off the affordable um, ADUs, that you end up with, what was it, 550 square foot um, home that would probably be, um, that could possibly be sold as a second home because to the property owner, that would kind of be an ideal situation. If you sold it to somebody as a second home, there wouldn't be anybody there for a large part of the time. So I, I, th I just, I think it could um, provide that, um, another way to provide access into um, home ownership. However, I think it does need a little more exploration rather than us just saying we like the idea or we don't like the idea tonight. I think it, it, it needs more exploration and this one definitely needs more outreach. There hasn't been any outreach at all in terms of um, anything that happened during the ADU ordinance. So, so if I could restate that, Mary, I, I kind of like what you're saying, which is let, let's go ahead and pass attachment C as effectively a, as in a moratorium so that this doesn't happen. This is a hypothetical problem, or maybe it has happened, we don't know. So that doesn't happen going forward, but then we can revisit it, because I know there's a plan for an ADU deep dive in, what, eight, 12 months next year, right? To look at ADUs, these are kind of emergency fixes. So I think, Mary, you're suggesting a past attachment C now, but be open to revisiting it if there are maybe some exceptions later. Well, I think this would be a work plan item, so. Okay. Um, Maybe Thoughts? it's something we could discuss as a work plan item. Thoughts on Mary's idea? Uh, so I guess if, if we're prohibiting it without public input, that seems no better than uh, approving it or allowing it without. So I would probably just do nothing and then ex, you know, plan on, on having the public input. I would leave it as is because if we haven't had any input, why, why would we prohibit it? And I don't think it's an emergency warranting a moratorium because as far as we know, it's not happening. So I don't know that we can say it's, you know, it, this is an emergency situation. So if we're not going to pass it, I would probably just leave it. Well, if we left it, we could lose affordable units. How? Because they would build a larger unit for the affordability. And then if they condo it off, then it would go to market rate. The other thing I'm worried about is, um, is the licensing issue because the license is held by the property owner. And so, this has always been subservient. You know, we've got the, the house and then the little house or the, the basement or the attic or whatever it is, and it's a license granted to the owner. And if, the, if, if that can be parsed off and it kind of is out there floating in space as its own, you know, um, legal ownership, it, you know, we, we don't have a whole lot of recourse over that property owner to comply with the ADU rules because the license is held by somebody who's got now a big bag of money and they don't care what happens. You could take the license away, he doesn't care because there is no longer a license to ADU effectively, right? There's an, there is a property interest out there, a condo property interest that's, that sits out there, and they got there through the ADU back door effectively, and, and now we really don't have any more control over that, whether it's affordable or not affordable, and that's really what I worry about. 7-0 planning decision. <laughs> one, one, one last on this one, didn't they say that we should look into it? I don't know that they did they? Yeah, they recommended this be uh, further considered by city council. So there's not a specific recommendation um, to adopt one way or the other. So just one last comment. Um, with respect to non-affordable ADUs, I think there is more benefit to the community uh, by having a 14 or 15 or $1,600 rental than there is having a 300 or $400,000 uh, for sale property. I'm, I'm not insensitive to entry level properties for buyers, but I think our greater need is for people who can't afford even to rent here. Um, and I would also fear greatly that many of those properties will end up as pied a terres, vacation homes, et cetera, because instead of you know, spending you know, $900,000 to buy a home that you're going to visit a couple of months a year, you now have done it for $400,000. And that just takes it out of circulation entirely. Okay, so I think I've heard two, um, 
two things. One is attachment C, which sounds like there's some people in favor of, and then another version is attachment C um, with, uh, but only applying to the non-affordable ADUs. Well, can I, yeah. I, I can basically pull that one from my okay. from my perspective. Just the, uh, what Mary said was a, a good point that, I mean, to me, it's important to not lose the affordable ADU um, mm -hmm. units. And so I, I would want to prohibit that. But I think Mary's point that um, this probably does require some more analysis. This is a, it's kind of a, a tricky technical subtle issue. Would the prices, how would the prices of rental versus mm -hmm. ownership compare? So maybe we could put this on the, the to-do list for when we get back to ADUs um, in a, a year or so. Okay, so now we're down to two options, which is um, we're gonna revisit it no matter what. The question is, do we, do we um, put, a, put a prohibition on it under attachment C, subject to further change when we revisit this, or do we um, let it ride for now um, under attachment and not pass attachment C and revisit it? So I guess that's where we're at. Judy? So if we were what, um, thinking of what Rachel mentioned about public participation, since we will, we, be, we will revisit it in how long, a year or so, can within that time have that public participation that Rachel just mentioned? It's a question for staff, I think. Well, I think, can we just say, we assume that there will be public outreach as part of the ADU update, right? Yeah. And so just include this as part of that outreach. Yep. Okay. Other comments? Why don't we just go ahead and, and poll on this one and, and it, who's in favor of attachment C? It looks like we've got a majority on that one too. Okay. And Rachel, I assume you're the you're opposed. You can hold up. That's fine. So I think we've done it. Um we can get to Anything else you need from us before we go to a motion? I don't think so. So if just counting votes, if it felt like we had um, either unanimity or at least a pretty strong majority in favor of attachment B, and it looked like we had a ma strong majority on attachment C. So I think that, which option is that then? I think it would be option two. Option two. Um, well, he said new further action, but then your footnote is, but attachment yeah, C, right? Okay. That's right, yeah. We were, yeah. we're recommending that you recommend that A and C okay. or B and C. Okay, great. Someone want to make a motion? Before, before you make a motion. Oh, yeah, sorry, David. Um, th I would like to propose one minor amendment to um, attachment C, and that would be, it says no person shall sell. If we could change that to no person shall convey. Okay, um, great. Just a little bit more inclusive language for good lawyer word yeah for lo for real estate transactions okay. so we want to make a motion go ahead no go ahead okay i'll make it but i don't know what to say <laughs> Just put, it, put it in your own words and the law lawyers will get it right so yeah, okay yeah there we go oh. start with that motion language and perfect and then do uh, attachments uh, motion to amend on second reading with language shown in attachment C to the staff memo ordinance 8372 amending subsection 964A accessory units BRC 1981 to modify the roof pitch standards for legally existing accessory structures that are converted to an accessory dwelling unit and to clarify existing ADU standards and setting forth related details. And linking it to the attachment B version I think as part of that. And linking it to the attachment B version. And, and, and does that, in, that incorporate as attached? By does that incorpor in, includes attachment yeah. C then, right? So yeah, C, I, I, C I think it B. would just be um, motion to amend on second reading with the language shown in attachments B and C of the staff memorandum as amended. You okay with that? Yes. And then, and then the rest of the sentence. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Um, Lynette? This is a show of hands. Show of hands. All in favor? It doesn't matter. It's up to you. I mean, all except for number five. I'm not sure how to make that. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a package. Okay. Yeah. Got to do it on balance. Okay. So I, I think I saw. Yeah. It, did I see um, seven hand, eight? Well, on balance. On balance. Okay. We yeah. we do that. They're great. It's unanimous. I think this was going to require a third reading because of the of the attachment C. So, if it's okay with everybody else, we're going to um, on on emergency, not emergency, but on third reading in a couple of weeks, we'll pass this on consent. Okay. Good. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, guys. Good discussion. Thanks, Rachel, for. <laughs> Thank you for bringing your book, Carl. Thanks for everyone who came out to testify.
Your next item is the homelessness strategy update. Got a lot of movement going on. Fading fast, but I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it for two hours, though. Oh, are you? Like <laughs> what if we're on paid or something? Wait we just a few minutes. Settle down. Leave when you need. Yeah. Well, I'd like to hear the information if I, if I can, but I think it's an important topic. If you see me snoozing, <laughs> well, I gave out. Vicki, I want, just want to say that I love your emails. They're so comprehensive and thorough and responsive. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are we waiting on you? We're waiting for a couple of things. Yeah. Vicki, are you turned on? Yes. I am. Okay. I think it's a height issue. You have to speak straight into that. Wait for one, <laughs> one ish more. Do some push ups. One arm push ups. Mm -hmm. Do a contest. Thank you for that. We'll we'll uh, we'll try to speak into the mic. Let's um, go ahead and go. Great. Thank you. Um, we're on to matters from the city manager, and let me turn it over to Kurt Fernhaber and Vicki Ebner, who will be talking about homeless strategy and the homeless memorial deaths review. Kurt. Uh, good evening, council. So I'm going to start our what was our established presentation with a a, um, a short pre presentation. Um, so um, uh, at the request of Aaron Brockett and Rachel Friend, they asked for um, additional analysis on the information um, that was received from the homeless memorial in December um, of last year. Um, so I'll start off by saying that the the data around homelessness is is critical to the work that we do, and having um, good data is incredibly important. And so during the evening tonight, we're gonna be presenting a lot of data um, to tell the story of what we've seen so far. And um, it's important to um, actually dive into that data to understand um, what it means. There was, um, I believe, um, a fair about of, uh, amount of misinformation that would have been sent out um, over the last uh, few weeks I'm around this as well. Um, 
One, I think, being from the daily camera, um, indicating that 48 deaths had occurred by people who were, who were experiencing homelessness. Um, so we'll go into that data um, to understand that, why that and some of the other um, information um, needs more clarity. So out of the, uh, the 48 names that were, were on, the, on the memorial, um, so I'll, I'll start from the bottom um, of the graph on the lower left. So five of those uh, deaths occurred in Longmont. Um, 19 of them were housed, and we'll go into more information about those that were housed. Um, one um, uh, passed away outside of Boulder County. Um, I think it was near Grand Junction. Um, and um, there was 23 deaths um, that for the remaining of Boulder County. So that would, that would include places like Netherland, Lafayette. Um, so we analyzed this data with um, the, um, the, the Boulder County Connect system, which is a system that sort of ties our, um, our, our homeless work together. Um, and that's, that's the same information that Bridge House would have used as well. Um, so out of those um, uh, 23 individuals, um, 56% of them, or 13, um, had not gone to coordinated entry um, for screening. They hadn't spent um, any days at severe weather shelter. Um, and um, six of those deaths happened um, during the summer periods. Out of the, the seven deaths that occurred during the severe weather shelter season, um, six out of the seven of them um, severe weather shelter was open, and in, 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 in the majority of the cases, the shelter, the, the severe weather shelter had been open for several, several previous nights. On the one um, death that occurred when severe weather shelter wasn't open, the temperature that day was 71 degrees, um, and it was 43 degrees um, that evening. Um, then there was ten, uh, 10 individuals that went through coordinated uh, entry through the screening process. Seven were referred to uh, Boulder Shelter for the homeless. Um, three went through navigation. Um, and there was f um, five of them who stayed at um, severe weather shelter for a period of time. Um, and, um, t t t and, uh, and out of that, two of the deaths um, occurred during the severe weather shelter um, season. Um, and, um, uh, and, and there was, um, um, the severe weather shelter was open for, for 15 days prior to their, to their death. So you, um, also wanted to know the, the cause of death. So, um, I, I also want to thank the, the Boulder County coroner for really, um, assisting us with this work. Um, this is a little bit, um, outside of their workload. It was sort of a special request. Um, so you can see the, the various causes um, um, along there. The, the two that I will point out, um, the first one is the, uh, the pneumonia. There was three individuals that passed away from pneumonia. Um, two of those happened during the, the summer months, and one of them um, happened where there was 44 um, continuous nights of severe weather shelter. That would have been um, sort of last, um, um, the, the beginning of last calendar year, um, as well as the, the night that they passed away. Um, and they, they did not go through um, coordinated entry. Um, the hypothermia would be the other one that would, um, would, that would be curious. Um, and um, they, again, did not engage um, with the system. The, um, the severe weather shelter was open for the 15 previous nights um, before their death and on the, the evening of their death as well. So Bob Yates um, asked on Monday about the, um, the cause of deaths for those that were housed. Um, so we don't have the information on all of them because there's not a coroner report for, for all of those. Um, but of the, um, the nine that did have a coroner's report, you can see um, how that breaks down. Um, a couple of those individuals, um, 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 I'd like to um, make mention, two of them had, had lived in housing for over 10 years. Um, 
the, the, the cancer patient, um, um, I think is, is worth highlighting as well. That is someone who, um, while have been being diagnosed with cancer, came to um, coordinated entry, were immediately um, sent to the Boulder shelter, and they were sort of fast-tracked in, in the housing queue, um, and fairly quickly went into um, permanent supportive housing with surrounding services. Um, and um, hopefully they died with um, a little more dignity as a result of those efforts versus um, dying on the streets. Um, so we're going to um, get into the severe weather, weather shelter um, a little bit later on in the presentation. So if there's any questions about the, the data here, we could stop for a minute um, if you had further questions. So Aaron and then Mark. <coughs> yeah, thank you for that credit, I appreciate that breakdown. Um, I think one of the part of our question was why the numbers were so much higher than in past years, because I think in past years they also included folks who were housed at the time of their deaths. So do we have any theories on, on why so many more people in 2019 than in previous years? Um, I, don't, I, I don't know that we have any theories that we would have any data to back it up, so I would be reluctant to, um, to give that opinion. Thanks. Mark? Uh, do, do I understand that chart that there were no exposure deaths occurring when the severe weather shelter was closed? That's correct. Well, except for during the summertime, and there was that one pneumonia, um, they were, it was also closed on that particular day, um, and it was closed as a result of having high temperatures outside. Thank you. C kind of maybe following on um, <clears throat> Aaron's question, um, the, so it sounds like it's a combination of people that are housed, <coughs> that may have been formerly ho homeless at some point in time in their lives, some people that were homeless at that time, some people that were Boulder or Boulder County, or maybe even a few people that are outside of Boulder County. Who, um, who makes the determination? I mean, where did the 48 come from? Who, 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 who kind of put that together? And it kind of goes to Aaron's question about, you know, you have one number one year and another number the other year, and I guess what we're trying to grapple with is, was there a change in methodology there, or was there, in fact, an increased in number of deaths by people who were either homeless or formerly homeless who had some connection to Boulder County? Do, do you know the answer to that? Um, I'll answer it the best that I can. Okay. Um, and um, if I'm out of line, um, I think Bill Sweeney will wave his cane at me. Um, so um, Bill, Sw Bill Sweeney works for Bridge House, and okay. he's been um, um, he's been doing this um, process for a few years. Um, when I spoke with him um, a few days ago, he indicated to me um, that he felt that his process was consistent mm -hmm. um, from year to year. Um, I believe that he um, um, he's net networked with this community, and so as he hears about deaths through other nonprofit organizations or people that he knows, he um, or, or even through the the police department, he would um, he would record that um, during the year. Um, I asked him the same question: um, Why do you think there's more deaths this year? He was also baffled um, by that and. So I, I think we're all a little bit baffled by it. Yeah. Rachel? Uh, first, thank you for getting that data. And Vicki, if you helped, and to the coroner, if they're watching or listening, thank you um, to everybody who did that so quickly. Um, so also following up on Aaron's question, will there be more digging into comparisons to previous years or getting data from what were the causes of death in the last few years and seeing why it, it escalated so much? or an effort to come up with a working theory? So we, we typically use a different data set. Um, we use the coroner's report, and they come out with an annual report every year. Um, the problem is it comes out at a different time of the year. It comes out in mid-year um, for the previous year. Um, and um, they have a, a different but consistent um, methodology as well. Um, so the information for 2019 will come out um, mid-year 2020, um, but we can follow that. Um, in fact, I think it was either last year or the year before um, when we were up here, we actually reported on, on, on 
on the on the coroner's report, and we we've used that as sort of a um, a data um, point as well. So could could we just make that request of you now, when, whenever that comes out in mid year, and to the extent that there's some maybe. You, we can do a two or three or four year, however far back in time we look back, so we can see for trends. Because obviously, you know, there's there's probably some lumpiness from year to year, just because sure. you know we're talking about a pretty small data set. So um, I don't mean to be people or data sets, but I mean these are relatively small numbers, and so with small numbers, you often see variation. So to the extent you can go back in time, you know, for however long the the coroner's been doing this, and then maybe report to us, and if we can see some trends, whether up or down or flat or sure. lumpy or what they are. Yep. Okay, now we're going to start the presentation. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction here, then I'm going to pass it over to Vicki, and then she'll eventually pass it back over to me. Um, there's a lot of information that we're trying to cover tonight um, because this is a real priority um, for the city where we would like to be as comprehensive as possible. Um, so this is what we're going to be going over tonight, these, um, these six different items. Um, so... Um, um, the background, and again, that was requested by um, Council Member Yates. Um, because this is a new council, just a quick overview of our strategy, um, what we're seeing from the results of that. Um, we'll spend some time looking at severe weather shelter um, and some of the information around that, because we know that will be a, a clear point of discussion for this evening. And then, you know, gaps and challenges. Where, where are we not doing well or where are we concerned? Um, and then I'm going to give, um, at the very end, just a couple minutes um, to, to Heidi Grove from uh, Boulder Solutions for Bo or Homeless Solutions for Boulder County, um, which we, this is part of a, a bigger umbrella. Um, so on, on Monday, Bob asked me to spend um, uh, five minutes talking about the history of everything. I think it was actually Sam, but I'm interested too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, you're here tonight. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be as brief as I can here and just highlight a few things um, that are that are worth noting. So um, in the early 1980s, um, there was a lot of changes in the federal government. Um, a lot there was a lot of closure of mental health facilities. What we know is that people that exited those facilities, um, about 40 percent of them became homeless in the first six months. Um, it's taken a long time, and we're probably we're not there yet in in um, providing the mental health um, services that we actually require um, in our communities. The other thing I was looking at um, today is our our budgets around housing, um, and um, so this is sort of a, a little bit of a snapshot. So in 1978, um, the the budget for HUD was 83 billion dollars. Um, in um, 1983, so five years later, it was $18 billion. So you can, you can imagine the impact that that would have. <laughs> a lot of that is like Section 8 vouchers. So there was a lot of people who lost um, that type of support, housing support um, during that time. And it wasn't until the net late 1980s um, that low-income housing tax credits um, began and started to replace um, some of that damage. Um, our 2017 budget for HUD is, uh, is $43 billion. So the other interesting thing that I noted today is that in 2017, the uh, tax credits that you get on your interest for owning a home um, was $144 billion. So we're subsidizing homeowners at three times the rate as we're um, subsidizing um, those with like Section 8 type housing. Um, I think that's something worthwhile taking note of. Um, also in the, in the 1980s, there was a realignment of Social Security um, and SSDI eligibility. Um, a lot of people came off um, as a result of that. Um, the AIDS epidemic in 1990s, that really showed us that health and housing are, are very interlinked. Um, and that's become a, a, a way that we, particularly with homelessness, health and health and housing um, are just go hand in hand. Um, there, the, the development throughout the U.S. 
um, started building fewer smaller units and more and, and larger units um, during that time. Um, we, we've seen in our other presentations the disparity, even in our low, or most importantly in our local um, economy, between um, rents, house prices, and, and incomes. Um, the foreclosure crisis in 2007, and then um, you know since 2010, construction um, nationwide of high income units has gone up by 36 percent. Low income units, it's gone down by by 10 percent. Um, so that's sort of the more of the global picture. Um, and homelessness is a an issue that is affecting. Um, um, cities across the country, um, cities that are um, have better better weather and better services um, have more homeless um, challenges um, because they are um, th th they travel to those areas. Um, the city Boulder is a, a very attractive um, place to be. Um, so this is sort of the background of all the pressures that you know that got us to where we are today. And I think that's, that cities are seeing that they're having to take a lot more responsibility for both affordable housing and homelessness. Um, so I'm going to pass this over to Vicki now. Thank you. So as Kurt mentioned, uh, the disproportionate effect of our basic economy is that we've seen a major decline in the number of lower rent units that are being developed. In the on the slide, the red section over there is uh, showing that we're one of the highest areas with, or sorry, we're one of the areas with the highest decline in the in lower rent area. It's also really important to understand that Colorado's economy is one of the fastest growing in the nation. So if you look at uh, people who are reporting unsheltered homelessness per a proportion of the total population, it's actually going down. Our actual concrete numbers of people experiencing homelessness in Boulder is going up, but as is the rest of the population. One of the things we use to, mem to uh, track kind of how we are doing against other communities in the nation is the point in time count. I will give you a caveat that it is not a good measure of actually how many people are experiencing homelessness in the nation. It is merely a benchmark measure that is used throughout um, and it is good for looking at uh, annual comparisons and community comparisons. With that being said, um, while we don't want to ever see any kind of increases in the number of homeless people, what we do see is that we have an increase that is actually lower than some of our partners. Uh, for example, Fort Collins, Colorado is seeing a almost 43% increase. The greater Denver area is seeing a, um, which includes us, is, is an 8% increase, and Denver City and uh, County is up to 14.5%. Uh, we did include some of the other cities that are somewhat comparable to Boulder in the way that they're constructed, meaning that they are college communities that have uh, some affordability issues, and you can kind of see that we're all, that they're a little bit all over the board. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment about Eugene, Oregon, because that's a city that um, some council members and staff um, visited a few years ago. I think it was in 2016. And I did look at the population of Lane County, where Eugene is, and it's almost exactly the same as Boulder County. It's a little over 300,000. And uh, it was just very dramatic to me, that not only their 32% increase year over year, but also the fact that a county with roughly the same number of people as Boulder County has um, more than three times as many homeless people. Um, so it's just an observation to make, because I know that we went to Eugene, Oregon to see how they do things right. And I um, guess I'm wondering if if they're a success story compared to some of the things that you guys were about to talk about. I think they've done a lot of things that are really good. Okay. Um, it, some of this is controllable by the local jurisdictions and some of it is not. As Kurt mentioned, there is an attractiveness for people to move to different locations, whether they're housed or unhoused. People are looking for better opportunities and better locations. So some of their increase in homelessness may be related to just general migration patterns. Um, but you know, there are 
things that we can look at and I think things that we as a community have done really well with, particularly around using data to make decisions and to look at things in an objective manner and the way that we can best help people and reduce the overall homelessness and population in the community. Great, thanks Vicki. So in 2017, late 2017, uh, the council adopted homelessness strategy goals. And so what we do is in line with all of these stated goals, really focusing on how we move people to housing options, how we make sure that we're preventing homelessness, particularly in family situations, looking at that data and more importantly, using that data to provide access to the public of what we're doing and how we're doing and looking at a continuum of services to meet people where they are. One of the major ten tenets of our strategy is a concept called Housing First. Housing First is used to do just that. We provide housing before we worry about somebody's sobriety or somebody's ability to stabilize. And what we found through national research and best model programs is that it's actually the best possible platform that we can use to help people improve their, their quality of life. And all the services are designed to work toward supporting that housing stability as opposed to getting somebody clean or making sure that somebody is uh, employable if they're employable. Um, it's also a very cost effective manner when you start looking at community costs. Community costs for uh, not providing housing, for uh, having people remain unsheltered homeless is somewhere between thirty to $50,000 per year per person. Um, that includes things like emergency room visits, um, impacts to our police departments, uh, judicial systems, et cetera. Um, we can provide permanent supportive housing, which is not only rent assistance, but the supportive services that come with that for $20,000 per person per year. A lot of questions have come up about coordinated entry and how it works. This diagram kind of shows how we deal with coordinated entry. Coordinated entry is our front door into our homeless services. When somebody has come in to coordinated entry, what we ask is if they have been in the community for six months or, or more. And I'd like to take this opportunity to clarify that that is a self-report. There is not a proof document that is required. When somebody says that they have been in Boulder County for six more years or more, what we wanna look at is, is there a better manner which we can address their immediate crisis? Even if somebody is very vulnerable and has been in the community for a long time, if there is a way that we can help them with that immediate crisis instead of entering them into a sheltering system, then they're going to be better off. And so we look at, is this person divertible? And I'll get in a little bit later what diversion services are. Um, but if that person cannot be diverted, then we look at their disability status. And again, this is self-report. If somebody is reporting a disability, then they're going to be screened to the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless up in North Broadway. Um, if they do not report a disability, then they would go to our navigation services, which are currently provided by Bridge House at the 2691 30th Street location. If somebody's not going to have their six months of uh, Boulder County community membership, then uh, they still have diversion services offered to them. And they can also use severe weather sheltering, which is open to anybody experiencing homelessness on weather triggered nights. One of the things we looked at when we're looking at our coordinated entry is what is the impact of residency status when people are coming through our front door. As you can imagine, when we first implemented the program, the vast majority of the people were longtime community members. Um, as a matter of fact, about two thirds of the population was reporting at least six months of Boulder County residency. And only about a third of them were saying that they were, had been in the community for less than six months. At this point, we've flipped that. And we flip that almost identically, so that we're looking at two thirds of the population is coming to us new to the community. Um, a lot of that change has to do with transitioning people who are um, 
homeless into housing. So a lot of the people who have been in our community for a very long time have uh, obtained housing. And so we're starting to see that new fill in from people who are newer to the community. I mentioned diversion services earlier. This is a new program. I should say it's it's an existing program that we're going to be uh, improving. Um, currently, Bridge House provides diversion services as part of their part of their overall navigation program. They refer to it as immediate response. Um, the diversion program is designed to be a very targeted and quick response. It, the idea is to reduce somebody's need for sheltering, because we all know that long-term shelter stay can be very debilitating for people. And it provides, where necessary and not for every client, um, some small per-client expenditures to help them with immediate crises. And the, really, the idea is about problem solving. Our year-round programs are two. The first is the Housing Focus Shelter. This is uh, run by Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, and it is structured to help the people who are the most vulnerable in our community. So they are really looking at long-term housing options for people, looking at connections to those men medical, mental health, basic needs, but really more importantly, what kind of housing is going to lead to long-term or permanent supportive options. Our navigation program, which is run by Bridge House, uh, focuses on case management, but it's a little bit less intensive. It, um, as I mentioned on the flowchart, we're looking at people who have fewer barriers or are newer to homelessness. So we target, or I shouldn't say we, Bridge House, targets uh, their responses and their interventions to that person's unique needs. And so you end up with some really creative solutions for housing options for people or family reunification, or um, getting people connected with longer term programming such as the Ready to Work program. One of the questions that has come up is what happens after May 31st, 2020. Um, at the end of May, our lease at 2691 30th Street does end. Um, I would add the caveat that this was a temporary location. We knew it was a temporary location, so we have been planning since the day we started as to what will happen and what will occur in order to make this a smooth transition. Coordinated entry, while it's provided by Boulder Shelter for the Homeless Personnel, it's actually run through the 30th Street location, and we will be providing that service at 909 Arapahoe, which is our Aging Well Center West. The uh, housing focus shelter will continue at Boulder Shelter for the Homeless. Our navigation program will move from 30th Street to the Broadway location under um, the operations of Boulder Shelter for the Homeless. Our severe weather shelter uh, does say TBD on there. Um, we are actively researching and working with architects and feasibility studies for um, a few locations. The primary location is the YMCA on um, Mapleton. Uh, there are some things that we're looking through to make sure that that's gonna be a good fit code-wise. Uh, so we are still looking at a couple other options. And um, you know, I would say to that that we've been very purposeful in that research and we, we've been making some serious progress on that. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Kurt. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the housing results. Um, and so you'll, you'll see at the top that, so this covers the last two, two years or 25 months. Um, so 754 um, individuals have, have um, gone into some type of housing. So 366 have gone um, into housing, um, um, a, a good number of them through um, uh, the Boulder Shelter as well as Bridge House. Um, 270 individuals have been united with their, their families or networks. Um, and 118 have gone into um, particular programs, um, long-term treatment programs. On the right is something that I find encouraging. Um, um, so Vicki was talking about um, some of the challenges of living in a shelter. It's not a great place to um, Im improve yourself. Um, in fact, most people um, decline in a shelter um, environment. 
So we're trying to reduce the length of time that they're in the shelter. So you can look at this um, in the blue is the number of individuals that had 300 stays or more, and then 200 to 300 and 100 to, to 200 stays. So you can see that the number of individuals with those types of stays has gone down um, from one year to the other. It's, it's still too high, um, and we, we need to continue to make progress on this. We move on, looks like we have a couple questions. Process question, should we ask questions as we go along yeah, let's, here? Let's, are you okay if we interrupt with a few questions? Sure. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, what happens to people who fail out of the system? So, you know, say they become disruptive or they have, you know, mental disabilities that don't allow them to be within the system anymore. What, what do we have for those people? Yeah, so um, both the um, both of our shelters, the Boulder Shelter as well as um, Bridge House, do have um, have rules um, at their facilities. It's kind of like having a sleepover every night for you know 130 of your best friends, um, and so they need they have rules that are required you know for the safety of the residents as well as the people who are working there. Um, we, we looked at the data and it showed that it's relatively about the same, of, same number of individuals that are, that are um, 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 having um, issues related to um, being excluded from the shelter in, in, in both facilities. Um, and um, the, the one thing that I, um, and, and there's, there's different levels, there's, there's short term and long term depending on um, the number of times or the, the action that was, that, that, that was taking place. Um, one of the things that we've um, made some good progress on but we need to continue to make progress is working with the court system. There are individuals that, um, w that don't engage with the shelter systems or, or our coordinated entry. Um, and there's, there's individuals that won't do well um, in the shelter system. Um, through the court system, we've actually been able to transition people directly from the court system into housing without going through any of the shelters. Um, and that's really working with people on an individual basis. So it sounds like to me that there, if somebody were to fail out or something along those lines, there's still a, a gap there that sort of needs to be addressed. And those, those individuals um, would also um, have severe weather shelter available to them. I would also add that uh, we did reach out to Boulder Shelter for the Homeless to get some data around the number of people who have been de denied services because of disruptions or whatever reasons. Um, one thing I would add is that even somebody who has been given a long-term denial, that is not a forever situation. At the end of the year, they have the ability to appeal or to, to discuss it with shelter staff to come back into the sheltering situation. There's also community mediation that is available um, that they can work with the different parties to get uh, their cases heard. We looked at the number of people who had been long-term denied the last year and people who had gotten a 60-night ban, which is the second highest level of banning as a percentage of the total unique number of people they served, which was a little less than 1,300 people last year, it was long-term denials were only 1.86% of the total people that they saw. Um, so it is a relatively low number. It's fairly in line with other national uh, high-need shelters. Um, so the, the important takeaway from that is that while there are people who are not successful in shelters, we do not give up on them. We're still looking at, as Kurt mentioned, the court system. We look through working with our hot team, severe weather sheltering, uh, general engagement, looking at other programs that would work for people. Real quick, can you give me the total number the, of people that were served, just so I know what that percentage equates to? Uh, One point Boulder eight. Shelter? Yeah. It was uh, 1,290 people that they saw last, th their last fiscal year, which is, runs from October to September. Um, and the people who had long-term denials, there were 24 of them. And do you have any data on when they do, um, sorry, I forgot the term, when they have a back and forth, when there's a disagreement, um, how many people actually get back into the system right away versus how many people are continued to be denied? Yeah, I, we wouldn't have that information tonight for you. Um, and um, what, I, what I would say is 
um, after our discussions from a year ago when we had this um, at City Council, we put more effort into um, um, having our mediation team spend time um, at severe weather shelter, navigation, and the Boulder shelter. So um, just making themselves more available um, um, to residents who may have those types of challenges. So there, there have been cases where our mediation team is um, assisted with that. Any other questions, on Rachel? Real quick, because I don't want to assume anything. I, I'm, but I'm, I am assuming that the results and trends on the left, we think, produced the outcome on the right, and it wasn't like the result of a change in procedure or saying you can only stay here, you oh. know, three hundred. So I just want to make sure that the left produced the right, and that's what we think. Absolutely. We're showing. Yeah. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you just mentioned mediation mm -hmm. and support for grievances, and I wanted to know if they are confidential, because I would imagine if I were staying at the mm -hmm. shelter, even if there were a lot of you know mediators were around, I would have a hard time going up to that mediator if it's right there. So is it confidential, and how is the process? Yeah, so it is confidential. Um, there's also a phone number there, so they can call um, or send an email um, to our mediation team. Um, in some cases, that person has come to our offices where our mediation staff is housed, um, and they can um, t talk about their concern there as well. Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. yeah. Once that happens, what is the following <clears throat> process for your office? So then they would, they would um, reach out um, um, to whichever shelter um, is involved. Um, and you know, tell them that there's an individual that wants to have a mediation. Um, a mediation is um, always something that both parties um, agree to. Um, and I don't know of any cases where a shelter hasn't agreed to mediation. Um, so um, that, that would be an overview of the process. Anybody else? Sounds we paused. We move on? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I remember um, two years ago when council um, approved this strategy um, and council asked me um, how are we gonna get there with housing and I indicated there was two things we needed to accomplish. One was units to put individuals in and the other was vouchers to help pay for it. So this is a, a summary of, of some of that success. Um, so you'll see at the top, so we've got countywide, we've got the city of Boulder and city of Longmont um, and um, um, and, and down at the bottom are sort of the, the four different bucket, buckets of, of vouchers. Um, so you can see that we've had a lot of success um, with vouchers. And quite frankly, um, in our community, we hadn't seen an uptick in the number of vouchers um, available to, for this kind of work um, in a long time. So when we started the process, we were a little unsure how that would go. Um, so you can see the 200 vouchers have been added um, um, countywide um, in the last 25 months. Also last week, um, we learned that BHP um, had just received an additional 39 vouchers, um, which is not on this list. Um, the, the last thing I'll add is that these vouchers also, um, and, and all the vouchers that we're working on, we coordinate the, the, the supportive services with them. So every person that's receiving one of these vouchers um, has supportive services. Um, at the apartment where they're living. So just to clarify, those 39 new vouchers, was it? Um, yes. So those are for uh, supportive housing specifically? That's correct. Great, yep. Do, and are they matched with units? Like would they go into their existing units? Great, because you- They're not project-based vouchers. Um, so they could go, um, um, they could go in units um, in, anywhere in the community. Great. Yeah. And just re remind us again, I think we, we passed them um, a rule about a year ago, was it, Mary, um, on the use of vouchers in um, market rate housing and prohibited discrimination? Is that right? Yeah, that's um, it, it's not, section eight. Section eight that wouldn't would apply to these then. That's the uh, it would st it would st still apply to these. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it um, wasn't it wasn't specifically I, I section eight. It was, no. no, it was right. income. It was source of income. Yeah, right. Right. The source of income. So, um, uh, with that being said. Um, it's a challenge, um, and so we have we have housing we have housing exits teams 
Um, I think they meet um, every two weeks, looking at the vouchers, the units that are available uh, with a list of the individuals and are always looking to um, align those things, um, including individuals that come through the court system. Great, thanks. So this is specific to the Boulder Shelter uh, for the homeless in North Boulder. Um, the little um, bars along the bottom indicate the number of individuals that exited from the shelter um, each month into housing. Um, and then the, uh, the orange is just the, uh, the cumulative uh, impact of that. So um, this past summer in 2019, um, uh, City Council approved um, an ATB um, increase to the budget. Um, for the voucher program that we had started as a pilot 18 months prior to that. Um, and we were so confident that you were going to approve it that we started planning beforehand. And you could see in July that we already started housing um, individuals. Um, so we definitely saw an uptick um, from that contribution of the city. So shelter uh, consolidation, that's something that you've been hearing um, from the public about and their, their concern around that. Um, I, I'd like to point you to the, the graph on the right first. That's um, path to home navigation. Um, and that's, um, that has 50 beds. Um, and the bars show the number of individuals that stay there um, on, a on average. Um, it's, it's an average of 38. Um, um, beds that are, are being served at a time um, out of the 50. Um, you'll see it's pretty consistent over time as well. So um, the, the, uh, the shelter, um, it will be moving there um, in another nine months or so. Um, and um, so we need to you know, create capacity there. So a lot of individuals have been saying, are you, are you gonna, re re you know, create replacement beds for those 50 beds that are lost? Um, the answer is no, we're not gonna create any um, more shelter beds. We're gonna create apartment beds. Um, and so you can see from the slides before, but that's what we've been focused on, um, getting, getting people into um, permanent beds. And um, so we're getting close, we're not, we're not there yet. Um, and we still have, as I've just spoken about, more vouchers that, um, that we can use. We expect that, expect that more people will be exiting the shelter. Um, we need to get down to a number of about um, probably 100, 120, 130 um, to, to comfortably uh, make that transition. Um, this is another way of looking at it, which I found very helpful. And um, it's 2019 and 2018. Um, so you can see in 2018, the average number of um, individuals um, staying in the program beds at the shelter, and then what that looks from, from 2019. So we're, de we're definitely on a, a, a trend um, in reducing that. Um, this is just one slide that I wanted to put in there. This is about individuals, but I wanted to talk just for two minutes about families. Um, and so in 2019, um, the city invested 579,000 in programs that support homelessness around families. It's, it's more of a prevention um, strategy. Our, our sort of our success story around that is the keeping families housed. That was a pilot that was started with EFA in 2017. Um, and in your ATB last year, you also increased funding to that. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's actually had remarkable um, outcomes and it's really gotten the, the families more engaged with services in the community. C could you pause and um, I, I seem to recall when we, a year or so into the pilot, you had some, some interesting, um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot if you don't have this data handy, but we had some really interesting um, numbers that kind of came out of that as far as the number of families that um, rebounded into a, a difficult situation and it was a pretty low number as I recall. Can you refresh our recollection on that? I don't, I don't remember those okay. numbers, but I'd, we'd be glad to That'd speak That'd be, it'd be good to have this in a report out, because I, I, especially in the next couple of months, because I'd like us to talk about, um, as we prepare the 2021 budget, whether this is a program that we want to expand. I, you know, we've we piloted a few years ago, looks like we bumped it up a little bit, but mm -hmm. I seem to recall you just had some phenomenal success stories um, I didn't have any EFA did. Well, EFA did, they but I mean, you, you conveyed to us some phenomenal success yeah. stories. I think that would be to the benefit of the community and the new council members to hear uh, how this program is, is doing. Absolutely. 
Um, yeah, and we could maybe even provide an update with that as well. Um, okay, severe weather shelter. Um, so this is sort of a summary of the 2018, 2019 season, um, you know, showing the, the, the number of nights that it was open. Um, it's, you know, open oct October through May. Um, what, what I find interesting, which was similar to the previous year, is the median nights was 3.5. So there's a number of individuals that are there for a very short period of time, and then, you know, they don't return. Um, they're either people that um, are, are coming through town or, um, you know, they're, they're camping, um, but they're not, um, they're, they're not using that. Uh, but, but there, there also is a category of, of individuals that actually use severe weather shelter on a very consistent basis. Um, and you can see 846 um, um, individuals that used it over that time. Um, so down at the bottom, that's something that um, reinforces what Vicki was saying earlier. So 48% of the individuals going through um, coordinate entry have been here for less than, been in the community for less than a month. Um, and again, 68% have been in the community um, for less than six months. Before we move off that, like uh, you mentioned it was open 169 nights, that is the, th the triggers were, th um, thresholds were triggered. How many, um, is this October 1 to May 31? So roughly 210 potential nights? Last year it was 243 nights. This year it'll be 244 because we have leap year. Yeah, okay, so 169 out of 243, is that what we're talking about? Okay, So thanks. you're roughly talking 67% of the year. Okay. Although, although I'm, I'm gonna guess that uh, like May probably had very few nights open. So uh, if you, probably if you compress that to like October to mid-April or something, it'd probably be a fair amount higher percentage. That's correct. So um, I, I, I look at it every day. It's, I, I think it averages this time of year roughly about five um, nights a week, sometimes six nights a week. Yeah. So if, if we wanted that, that data, if you wanted, let's say we did it on a monthly basis, you know, we looked at December's and January's and February's, you'd be able to show us um, the utilization and maybe in January, February, it might be 25 or 26 nights out of the month and in May, maybe it's one or two nights out of the month, but you'd be able to do it on a month by Absolutely. month. Absolutely. Okay. We can pull it by month. I can also tell you between October 1st and November 14th of last year, it was open 23 of the 45 days. Uh, between November 15th and March 15th, it was open 112 of the 121 available days. And between March 16th and May 31st, it was open 34 of 77 days. So um, uh, this is um, a, a set of data points which I, I think might be helpful in the conversation as well. So this goes back to, to 2011. Um, um, you'll, you'll remember that BOHO was uh, an important um, um, organization in our community at that time around homelessness. Um, and they had um, a different approach. Um, their approach was to expand services um, to a degree where no one would ever be um, turned away or denied services. Um, and they, um, they went to um, every night as well. Um, so you can see they started off at, in 2011, at about 60 um, individuals per night. That's the blue line. Um, they got up to uh, 225 um, individuals per night. The um, sort of the orange line that goes up and down that's actually um, um, turnaways from the Boulder shelter. So what we, what we um, surmised from looking at this data is that as BOHO grew and the capacity of BOHO grew, the number of homeless individuals in the community also grew. Um, and so there was actually also a higher need for shelter, um, uh, requested shelter from the Boulder shelter. So you can see that that, that went up um, significantly. Um, it's now down um, quite a bit. I think uh, um, I might turn over to Vicki here. I think there was three or four nights last year where people were turned away uh, for capacity reasons, or uh, can you clarify that for me? Well, I, I can tell you that since I've been here, which is since, since March, uh, we haven't had any turnaways due to capacity at uh, Boulder Shelter. Yeah. We haven't had any in, in this in, in this season. 
Um, and that's also in part um, with sort of increased um, coordination between Bridge House and the shelter in trying to balance their capacities um, better. Um, but, but the turnaways um, are, are minimal. Um, but the, uh, the fire chief has also been pretty clear to us um, that we won't go over capacity. We, um, and maybe this is a moot point since we, we don't seem to be hitting capacity anymore, but if, if there came a night that we did hit capacity, um, would we provide transportation, was our practice or our providers practice to provide transportation to alternative um, sites? So what we do with severe weather sheltering, there are 72 beds for the actual severe weather shelter. Mm -hmm. um, the first wave is to use unutilized year-round program beds at the 30th Street location. Mm -hmm. So that location holds 122 people total between the two programs. Mm -hmm. If Bridge House ha looks like they're going to be hitting capacity numbers, mm -hmm. then they work with uh, Boulder Shelter for the Homeless to determine what they can take for overflow for their unused beds. And Bridge House actually runs a trans, they have their van that they take people physically over to the other location. Mm -hmm. And this is really a major system improvement that we've put it, I shouldn't say we, the two shelters work this out together <coughs> um, to put that in place this year. And that's why we haven't seen any nights where we've hit reported ca um, capacity limits. Um, there have been a couple nights that have been close, but generally yeah, we yeah. the other thing that I'll add is that um, um, over the last probably 18 months, um, all the organizations have been um, pretty diligent in their communication to the homeless individuals, particularly, particularly as the season starts, mm -hmm. indicating pe to people that there is um, a maximum capacity of shelter in the community, um, and they should take that into consideration um, when making plans for the season. Um, did I hit this slide or not? Oh, um, yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> we're, we're getting close here. Um, so these are some of the, the, the gaps and challenges that, that, um, that keep us up at night. Um, and the first one was highlighted in the data that I presented at the beginning. Um, the real story there is that people who are not engaged, do not engage with severe weather shelter, with coordinated entry, um, they're staying on the streets, we're not getting them in, into housing. Those are the people that are ending up, you know, going, going to Boulder Community Health. Um, and um, it's, it's a challenge for our community. Um, so we have to um, find new and better ways to engage with, with <coughs> individuals that are difficult to engage with. Um, meeting housing supply with demand. Um, um, I'm actually surprised at how much success we've had with housing um, and getting people housed. I'm not sure how long we can sustain that kind of growth. Um, I think over this next year, we're gonna continue to do well, but I, um, I, the, the level of, of housing that we're providing um, is gonna be difficult to continue. Um, uh, so coping with capacity challenges, we're, we're dealing with um, more individuals. Um, so all the services in the community that are aligned with homeless services, um, we need to work with different organizations to make sure that their capacity um, can meet that. Um, like mental health partners, they deal with a, a lot of homeless individuals, so ensuring that their capacity can meet that. Um, the last one is, is, is a difficult one, and it's certainly a policy question of balancing appropriate levels of service. And what I mean by that is we have been focusing primarily on um, homeless individuals that are um, um, chronically homeless <coughs> and most in need, um, most vulnerable. Um, and um, now we have to balance that with um, the number of individuals that come to our, and come to and through our community. What services are we gonna focus on individuals that have been part of our community and what, folk, what services are we gonna focus on those who are here for a short time? Um, so I'm going to um, hand it over to Heidi for just a couple minutes. She has two slides and then we're, then we're done. Good evening, Council. I know it's late, so thank you. Um, Heidi Grove, Boulder, Homeless Solutions for Boulder County uh, with Boulder County Community Services. 
And so Kurt and Vicki had asked for me to come tonight and present just kind of the overarching what is HSBC and how does it function and how is it structured. So the executive board is the senior government officials. Kurt is one of our executive members and it is a county, com county commissioner appointed position. And so it's with health and human, our housing and human services is represented, all of our housing authorities are represented. And so it's more of those that are bringing the funding services to the table to support the work that we are up to. The second level is the management board and that would be all of our executive directors and all of our service providers and not just Boulder Shelter for the Homeless or Bridge House, but we're talking all executive directors and policy makers across the homeless continuum of services. And so they make recommendations to the executive board around policy changes and really looking at gaps in the system and making recommendations on how to address that. The middle level is the implementation staff. So the management board makes recommendations to the executive board and then the executive board gives it to the city and county staff for us to actually implement those changes. And then the dedicated staff, um, I think that's me. <laughs> um, and so the additional pieces, so over the last six months, I've been in my position since July and we have, added way more work groups to really try to address those gaps that Kurt was just talking about. So the systems work group was one of the standing ones in prior, so that's our service delivery organizations, our partners that we actually deliver services based on the implementation strategies that we have selected. So we meet on a monthly basis to talk about boots on the ground, how are things rolling out, and where are the challenges from a policy to implementation and everything in between. Our communications group is a new one, which is really how do we tell the story on a regular basis so that people are fully educated and aware of where we're going in our process and what's, what our successes are. To, as Kurt mentioned, we have our housing exits, which is every housing provider or every organization that has access to housing resources meets twice a month to really talk about what is a robust housing portfolio and what could it look like to make sure that we are addressing the needs of everybody across the continuum of who touches homelessness. Um, outreach is also new, so we are, I think we've had two meetings. Um, we have our third this week to really talk about a cross-sector collaborative countywide outreach effort to engage those that aren't really coming into the door, so we're actually going out and connecting with folks. And then our other one that is also new is what we are calling the justice services, which is really looking at high utilizers across multi-systems and how do we best meet their needs, whether they are justice involved and have lengthy criminal histories or are the folks that are the revolving door in the healthcare industry, how do we really address their needs and their challenges when it comes to housing? Yep. So, um, when it comes to policy stakeholders, mm -hmm. can you give some examples real quick? Most of them are actually here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that would be like the executive director of Attention Homes, the executive director of Boulder Shelter, executive director of Harvest of Hope. We also have uh, 20th Judicial Probation that we just recently added. Um, the coordinated entry person for the Veterans Affairs, which comes up from Denver every month to meet with us. She's also coming, so we're looking at it more from a regional perspective, not just local. But no elected officials? No elected officials. Okay, and second question, is there anyone with lived experience? Yes, the management board has representation of folks with lived experience. Um, and another thing that we're trying on for this year's point in time count is we're actually going to be utilizing folks with lived experience to help us. We're gonna pilot it and see how that works and see where we can plug in folks with lived experience on a more regular basis. Great, other questions? I have a question. So um, thank you for staying late with us. Sorry, I'm a little tired, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the public comment, we had somebody um, come tell us their story about how um, 
they were struggling with um, part of the system that um, where coordinate entry, coordinated entry didn't occur until um, 9 a.m. and this person had to be at work at 4.30. Is that something that the systems working group would be looking at, at how, how to address something like that, or where would that be addressed? Um, actually, it's a little bit of both. So systems, yes, and outreach. So one of the things that we're piloting as we bring, bring on diversion services is mobile outreach, um, or sorry, mobile coordinated entry. And so we've actually run this pilot project in Longmont, and it's been really successful, and we're gonna be rolling it out in here in Boulder as well. So it's, Yes, there's the standing times, but we're also going to be doing coordinated entry out in the field when we're connecting with you. Just to build on that, is it is it, could, could you envision a day where, where people can actually self-coordinate an entry through a mobile device? I would love to get there. Okay. <laughs> um, we that is something that we have talked about. We're not there yet. Okay. Okay, so to your question, who are our key stakeholders? Um, for housing crisis resolution, obviously, we want to connect with folks that have access to sheltering and housing resources. And so those are our partners who really work on addressing those challenges. For outreach and other community resources, uh, those are more of the intermediate service providers who are really great at building relationships and connecting with folks who, th who then can connect folks those folks that they have great relationships with to housing resources. And then additional entities are those more area expertise folks, so uh, domestic violence experts, veterans affairs experts, um, attention homes with their expertise on the young adult population and emerging adult population, and then of course folks with lived experience. And as, re as reflected in the circle, that is the makeup of the executive board. Any questions? Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Kurt, yeah. is there anything else you wanted me to cover? You're good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So council, that's the end of our presentation. So we're open to any questions or discussion that you'd like just, to have. Just a process, process point, um, this, this is, um, um, largely informational for us. You're not seeking a decision from us on any particular matter tonight. This is to kind of catch us and the community up to where we've been, where we are, and where we're heading. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it, that, that's correct, as well as the challenges that we see. Right, right, okay. Um, kind of closing, um, either questions or comments for Kurt? I, I saw uh, Mark first in the area. Well, that's not so much a question. I think I've reached my sell-by date for the evening, so okay. I'm going to take off. Uh, but. <clears throat> Before I go, I want to commend you for that presentation. I thought it was terrific. And I think staff and all of the constituent organizations are doing fantastic work in, in this area. It seems to be clearly data-driven, um, rational, and effective. And um, I think you should all be very proud of yourselves, whether it's staff, Bridge House, EFA, Boulder Homeless Shelter, uh, whoever, I think. Uh, you are all performing a very valuable service for the community uh, and contributing a great deal. So I thank you all. Okay. And with that. Good night, Mark. We'll see you Thursday. Yeah. yeah. And thanks for sticking out with us. Good luck with your healing process. Thanks. I, I had a couple of questions about things that you went over <coughs> before that maybe just to drill into a little bit. So and it, it's kind of how things are evolving this year, you know, as we're going through the transition. <laughs> Uh, with losing the 30th Street site, right? And so, um, as here, so coordinated entry is is moving to um, is the senior center. Is it, uh, um, so, um, it's been previously called the the West Senior Center. Mm -hmm. um, it's been rebranded um, to Aging Well Center. Okay. <laughs> in in anticipation good. of you joining them soon. <laughs> right, yes, the, the aging well, very good. So uh, coordinated entry will, will be down there. Yeah, so we, we've looked at a separate entrance mm -hmm. um, on the west side of that building, so it would be a, a separate piece of the building which is with a <coughs> separate entrance, um, separate bathroom, um, to really distinguish it um, from those senior services. Okay, so you will be able to have it pretty separate then? That's correct. So probably good. Um, 
And so it, I, I very much appreciate the focus on uh, housing outcomes. So I think it's been a signal, signal success of the program for the last few years, and I know you all have done enormously hard work on that, as well as many of the folks, service providers out here, so absolutely to be commended. So, and, and I, I love the fact that, that what you're looking for is additional apartment capacity, not shelter capacity. Fantastic. But I, I remain concerned about the, 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 as we're working on that, about the sufficient capacity after the 30th Street location goes away. Because from looking at the numbers and the, the bars and in terms of um, whether the demand will fit in the space, it looks like we're not quite there yet, which is, I think, what you said. Mm -hmm. So um, so we're getting close, we're getting closer over time, but it's seeming to me le reasonably likely that by the time that the 30th Street location closes, we won't quite have the same amount of space um, at the shelter after that. And, and so what, what's our plan for dealing with that? Because if, we, if, we've, if we've got those 50 beds that are going away, but we've housed a lot of people, but it seems like fairly likely that we're gonna go over capacity sometimes. What are we gonna do with that situation? I guess we'll both try that, try our, um, to answer this. Um, so um, I'm more optimistic than you are about um, the, what the capacity will be at the shelter. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably more concerned about severe weather shelter um, than I am um, the issue of um, moving navigation um, the 50 beds of navigation to the shelter. Um, I think we're on track of where we want it to be. Um, I think we, we knew when we started that process that it was that it was going to be difficult. Um, severe weather shelter is, um, you'll be aware that we don't have a huge budget for that in the coming years. Um, we've tried to, as part of the strategy, we've tried to shift our budget more towards housing solutions than shelter solutions. Um, so we've been looking for um, a relatively um, inexpensive or free space. Um, even if you're paying for, for space, it's difficult to um, cite that type of use in the city of Boulder. Um, I'm relatively confident that we'll um, have a place in, but we'll have severe weather shelter in place um, by the fall, um, but we're not there yet. Okay, well, I appreciate the, the optimism on, on the capacity, and I gotta say, just 100% hope that your optimism is validated. But let, let's say that it doesn't go quite as well, and there is a capacity problem. Mm -hmm. what, the question remains, how would we handle that? Um, I think that our um, shelter approaches ha have always been um, relative to the capa capacity that we have. Um, so no matter where you are in your amount of capacity, there's always gonna be that risk. Um, we've seen that um, um, there's been an increase in the numbers of individuals that are seeking services that are from outside of the community. Um, those are the individuals that we've been communicating with or our service providers have been communicating with on a regular basis to let them know what the capacities what the capacity for shelter in the community is. Um, I think the communication um, approach is really important um, because many people can um, go to various different places um, seeking services. Um, it's important and responsible for us um, to indicate to people what services we have and what services we don't. As we saw with BOHO, um, when you try to um, take the approach of we're gonna serve everyone, um, it becomes actually very challenging. Yeah, and I don't think anybody's saying that we're gonna try to serve everyone from ev everywhere, right? That's correct. But, and we do have the six month threshold, right, for coordinated yes. entry and going to services, mm -hmm. so folks that got here very recently are not gonna be eligible, right, for those things. I guess um, I guess I remain concerned. I know when, when we uh, talked about this last March, I believe it was, you know, we, we did give direction, I, I believe, I, I mean, I looked it back up, that, that this uh, loss of capacity was something that was important to address. And so I think the, the answer I would be looking for is not just, well, we have less capacity and then we just service the capacity we have because we're, we're scaling back, right? And so I'm, I'm really hoping for 
some kind of mitigation if we if we don't if the losing the 50 doesn't quite fit our services into the space that we have do we have a kind of a mutual aid arrangement with um, the two facilities in Longmont whereby if, if we were a little bit short and they had a little bit extra we could transport someone there we don't have anything set specifically to that point um, Longmont itself is going through some changes on how they're providing navigation, so it would be a little premature to say that that's an option for us. Um, I would also add that there's a couple pieces of evidence that would back up Kurt's optimism. Uh, one is that uh, gets lost in some of our shelter capacity conversations, and that's the importance of finding housing for high utilizer shelter beds. Because not only are those people that are staying in shelters that need housing from a long-term standpoint, but they use, our, our high utilizers last year when we were looking at it, it was about 14,000 bed nights that could be made available to other people coming to the system. And uh, what's not shown in this presentation because the data was not available to us is that even in December, which is extremely high, utilization traditionally. Um, Boulder Shelter for the Homeless was averaging 128 people per night. When you combine that with uh, our usual average for uh, Path to Home, which Path to Home, because of the nature of what they provide, is not very cyclical, it's a pretty straight line. Um, it, they average about 37, 38 people. So that put us a, on average only five people short in December. Um, obviously that's five people short and that's an issue we're still working through. The other thing I would add is that we were very purposeful with our city vouchers that we received from the council in 2019 and 2020 allocations that they are targeted for high utilizers of our shelter services who also are very vulnerable and very in need of permanent supportive housing. And it's that direct targeting of that population that is gonna do two things. One is make sure that we're providing those permanent supportive housing resources to the people who really need them the most, who are long-term Boulder County community members. And thirdly, that they are high utilizers of the shelters. So that, that those are some things that really make us feel like those are really doable things. The other thing I would add is that bringing on a more robust diversion services program should help us address some of our high utilizers of Path to Home, for example, because uh, we'll be doing a little bit more quicker intervention with them. So we expect that some of the people who would traditionally have gone to a navigation program would be moving to more of diversion services. So that, that would also reduce this the shelter census. And I'll just add one more thing, sorry. And we, we've had more resources um, this year than we had last year to help people with those diversion transitions. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's all very encouraging and it seems like you're very much on the right track. I, th I think it would just be helpful to have a little bit of a plan B in, in case there is still some capacity question after the loss of the, of the facility. That's what I would ask for. Great, before we move on to Mary, I just wanna observe for council that we have um, in the room tonight um, Greg Harms, Executive Director of the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless. We have representatives from Bridge House. I think we have the police chief with us. So if anybody has questions of those subject matter experts, they're also available to come to the podium. Mary? So just a question about how many um, permanent supportive housing units are coming online in 2020. And were those included in that 200 number that we saw in the number of housing units? Um, well, as I mentioned, there's others that are that have come on that are um, above and beyond those. The 39? Yeah, I think there's, um, if I recall, there's 18 vouchers that we have right now that we're trying to, to place. Do you guys see the um, I'm sorry? 56 countywide that we're trying to, to place, yeah. And um, permanent supportive housing units coming online, That the 39 are the ones that are going to come online that weren't included in that. And just That's for clarification, right. yeah. those are vouchers? Oh, they're, they're vouchers, okay. okay. Yes. But housing units coming online then, what's that number? Um, so um, that number is a combination of both um, um, new housing or affordable housing projects um, that are occurring right now. Um, so one example I would give is uh, CCLO. Um, that's under construction right now. Um, 
I think that will be coming on in four or five months. Um, there's um, uh, um, uh, the one next to Red Oak Park on, on Belmont. Um, that's also under construction, will be coming on in later 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, um, some of our other partners, um, both Element and BHP, um, make some units available as they become um, vacant. As people move out of like one bedroom units, um, they have been making a number of those available to PSH um, voucher holders. So is that, um, when you when you put that together with the 239 vouchers then, um, is that kind of helping move people into permanent housing that then frees up some more of those, the high utilizers Absolutely. that you were talking about Absolutely. in the 14,000 bed nights. Yep. It, it frees up as those units come online and those vouchers are available. That's correct. Yes, if you ever wanna look at an exercise in complexity, go to a housing exits meeting. What we look at are um, the types of vouchers, the types of people who are needing certain vouchers, what makes sense, who do we target, what strategic placements need to be made, are the right mixes there. For example, the uh, housing authorities allow for up to 20% of vacancies to be utilized for uh, permanent supportive housing, which then is matched with SAMHSA grant that the county has for case management services. Uh, we have recently gone through a process of uh, reevaluating the criteria that we use in order to determine what's the best fit of the person that goes into those things. Um, I mentioned earlier the city of Boulder uh, vouchers are very much targeted to certain populations. There is our one home program which works through our regional partner that is really looking at people based on their vulnerability scores and is provided by Metro Denver Homeless Initiative. Um, there, there's a whole host of those things that go through um, down to this person's gonna do better in a Lee Hill apartment than they would do in a scattered site voucher. Um, so it, it's a tapestry of different interventions and housing opportunities and needs. Okay, Adam. Okay, I have quite a few things here, so bear with me. Um, First of all, um, what kind of happens to people who get into permanently supportive housing or, um, you know, are permanently put in housing and then fall out for one reason or another, drug use, mental illness that doesn't allow them to be there, violations of that sort, what ends up happening to those people? So I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but there, there is a percentage of individuals um, who are not successful in housing. Um, for some of the same reasons that you um, mentioned. Um, however, the um, supportive services that they receive, they have a, a case manager. So if they have a, a mental illness, they're gonna, the case manager is gonna help them connect to the correct services um, for that mental um, illness. Um, so there's a lot of individual attention based on the needs of that, of that person. Um, um, the, the lease is an agreement between that individual um, and the landlord. They are required to meet the requirements of a lease just like anyone else would. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> so I shared with council uh, a flow chart. Um, one of the things that I think we, we need to address more is just the comprehensive suite of items uh, that we could be utilizing in the city to actually help divert people away from homelessness or essentially, you know, uh, more options for them to, wherever they are in the system, uh, make sure that they don't end up at the level where they need even more help, whether that be medical or um, anything along those lines. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but currently we don't have anything for people who are living out of their cars um, um we, we do have something for people who are okay. coming out of their cars. Can you explain um, that a little bit, please? Sure. So they would they would go to coordinated entry. Um, they would park their car um, at 30th Street, and they would use the services that are provided to anyone else. Um, so you don't necessarily have to stay in their in their vehicle. Okay. Gotcha. Um, what I, could I just yeah, ask please. a quick follow up? Um, but if they don't want to stay in the shelter and would prefer to stay in their vehicle, can they leave the vehicle parked there and stay there? I don't think so. 
So that's one perfect example is maybe a safe parking system um, for those people who, again, for any, any reason, they might not wanna actually be in the system and we could divert them away from um, ultimately having a worst case scenario. Uh, so something along those lines, Kurt, I send this to you as well, this flowchart, so we can discuss this at a later time, but I think it's really important to start looking at more of these items. Um, and I'm gonna bring this up again during the council retreat. It's one of my very few items that I'm gonna bring that I think we should spend additional time looking at. Um, also just on the, the greater level, it seems to me like all economic indicators, all governmental indicators, all climate indicators would show that the numbers of people who are gonna experience homelessness are only gonna increase um, across the nation. And you know, we're looking at probably a future downturn, we're looking at a worsening climate that's gonna force a lot of climate migration um, and our, a government that currently isn't very interested in any drug addiction, mental health, or homeless service. So um, in my mind, you know, I, I think it's time that as a city, we really have the tough question of how much are we going to be willing to pay to make sure that people aren't living on the streets anymore. Um, it's a problem that I think in my short time on council, we have the most consistent number of emails and people coming to speak about and it's a problem that I've only seen grow ever since I've been here for 13 years. So um, I think this is the opportunity and this is the council that needs to say that it's no longer an option for people to be living on the streets and you know, whatever funding we need to divert because this hurts not only those people living there but it hurts people living in our community who are ho housed, it hurts businesses, it hurts everyone down the list and so um, I'm just gonna say, I think it's really important that we take the time at um, our retreat to come up with a more comprehensive suite of solutions as council that we're willing to look at to address this problem. And if we need even some council members to, to be on a working group um, for this entire year um, to actually make some progress on this because uh, I think I'm counted amongst many people who uh, don't want to see, you know, any more tent encampments on the streets because those people deserve to be housed and they don't want to see any more needles on the streets because those people deserve to have um, actual solutions in their lives that don't involve just giving them needles. Do we want to run add on to what Aaron uh, Adam said or, or disagree with what Adam said? Aaron and then Rachel. Well, so um, I sent on, out on, on hotline in the middle of this afternoon, uh, bringing back up something that, that uh, Suzanne Jones and I brought up about a year ago, uh, which was the, as, as a proximate step to some of the things that you're talking about, Adam, is the uh, idea of opening the severe weather shelter um, throughout the winter season uh, rather than having a temperature-based threshold. Um, you know, currently it's uh, 32 degrees um, when the severe weather shelter opens or 38 degrees if it's snowing or raining. But we, as we were talking about before, in, in the coldest months, that ends up being the large majority of the nights, you know, something 70, 80 plus percent. And so it just seems from uh, that, that adding, taking that to 100% of the nights during the cold months is a small change, it's a small amount of funding, but it means that, that there's always a, a, a safe place to sleep for someone, uh, a safe and, and, and warm place to sleep. So it just seems like in the, in the winter months, 34 degrees can still be a lethal temperature. Um, and we do have these thresholds for accessing services. You have to have been in the air for six months and such. And um, so it just seems to me like um, it's the, the sort of humane thing to do to allow folks to always have um, a warm kind of cot to sleep on during those months. So I, want, I wanted to bring that back up with the new council um, for reconsideration. Aaron, would, um, Adam had a, a, a list of, of things that he said that he'd like us to, or, and staff to, to work on and think about during the course of the year and suggested, I think appropriately, that, that these would be topics that we could talk about at the retreat in a week and a half and talk about as far as the work plan 
we would have to talk about, you know, where the folks fully supported that and staff would let us know how much work that would involve and some things you might want to have look at sooner rather than later or something's maybe it. Aaron, would you be would you be happy to, to um, throw that, that suggestion onto Adam's list and have that be a work plan discussion in a week and a half as well? <coughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's, it's a fine, I think having a discussion about our, our approach to homeless services at the retreat would be a valuable uh, way for the council to spend some time at our retreat. Um, I don't know that this this particular item has a huge work plan implication. I mm -hmm. mean, I think we, maybe we could ask staff to provide an estimate of dollars involved, say for for this year, um, if we were to move forward on that, in the, you know, in the next handful of weeks, um, and then maybe we can, if there's interest from council, we could look get more information about how it would work for a following shelter season. Great, Rachel, and then Mary. So. I I guess I, I don't know whether to really bring things up tonight versus the retreat and how much time we'll spend on this issue at the retreat. Um, it's also one of the very few things that I brought up for adding to the work plan. Um, but there are so many issues involved in this. I think one that we're hearing a lot about and that I, I agree with the community we need to look at is um, we've had two recent court decisions. Um, the Supreme Court rejected the I think Martin versus Boise appeal, um, and then we had a decision out of Denver, and, and there's, I think, some Eighth Amendment constitutional considerations that merit further discussion about the camping ban, um, and, and there are other issues attendant to that as well, so I think that's something we need to look at. I agree with Aaron that we should be looking at the severe weather shelter being open all season. I understand um, from talking to direct line staff that, that there may need to be safeguards built in to prevent abuse and, and people choosing to go to severe weather shelter instead of um, going through coordinated entry and, and sort of that might not be purely optimal, so you might have to build in some safeguards. Um, I agree with Adam's point about capacity probably needing to grow because of uh, climate migration and um, poverty rates that I, I think we all anticipate possibly getting worse. But also note that uh, Chris Nelson said that attention homes is already at capacity, so we know that we already don't have enough capacity. Um, at least for some of our services. We get a lot of complaints about the Ninth Street Bridge encampment and lack of enforcement right now. Um, I think we need to look at day services. I think we need to uh, have a robust discussion about uh, possible meth epidemic in our community. I think we need to talk about right to rest, safe parking, tiny homes community. We have to talk about people who can't really access service right now because they have pets or they're married or they're service resistant. And there are a lot of pockets, I think, that we are at the gaps that were pointed out that we don't have awesome solutions for right now. Um, and, and then I think we also do need to talk about the crimes and safety issues and, and how to enforce, but with compassion and humanity. I, I am uh, reluctant to criminalize, criminalize the process of sleeping or merely existing as a human um, or to to encourage more encounters with law enforcement in general. So I think there's so much that we have to talk about and I think we need a, a work group that has some council members on it, a lot of community members, a lot of uh, people with lived experience, the staff who has the expertise and the data. Um, and I think we need to do that sooner than later. And I think, you know, for something like the severe weather shelter, um, if we're talking about looking at that and, you know, pushing it back a week and a half and then talking and and it's the end of the season then before we do it, and if we're really concerned about getting that in place this year, I don't know if we want to delay. So um, I don't know what protocols have to happen to get a, a work group together um, that can move pretty quickly um, on putting together sort of a, a host of solutions, as Adam proposed, um, that we could have community engagement in, in one you know, one lump sum and pass some um, options that will help people to uh, avoid housing instability and becoming homeless. Okay. <coughs> well, so as I recall when this has come up in the past is that it wasn't a question of funding, that it's relatively small amount of money, Understood. but as I recall it was um, how that change would impact outcomes. And what comes to mind is that graph that was shown with the boho and then the turnaways. And it, 
I, I guess I would, you know, with that conversation um, at at the retreat or now, as <laughs> um, I would like to understand, um, one of the one of the things that staff mentioned during the presentation was that um, communities that are seeing more homelessness actually have better services. So I would like to understand that um, and um, and that graph of um, boho and then um, the number of turnaways at the shelter growing way higher than the rate of change of the boho um, housing, which was keeping things open every night as would a severe weather shelter. So I just want to make sure that we're not working against ourselves with something like that, where we end up um, providing or, or giving people a choice that is less healthy for them than focusing on housing, which is what we're doing right now. And um, so d I just want, to, want us to keep that in mind. Okay, just real quick. I mean, Mayor, I think you're, you're right that we need to make sure that we're focused on outcomes, and I think our strategy overall is doing a great job of that. But there are currently people who have no other option. I'd say if, if you've been here for, you know, 21 days and you find yourself homeless and, you know, th there's not another path for you at this point, right? So, so while we would want to maybe put some guardrails on it to uh, maybe prevent overly high utilization or certain kinds of things, we can talk about that. Uh, currently, we have a system that, um, a safety net with cracks in it with that people can fall through. And that's what I'm concerned about mm -hmm. primarily. Judy. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I suppose for many of us, you know, housi uh, housing homeless and providing better services to them is very important to many of us. And I've heard a lot here about how well we're doing meeting our long-term priorities of housing people. But I think there's a disconnect between the two, you know, the two um, presentations offered because, you know, Vicky mentioned, you know, we are really working really hard on meeting long-term goals as opposed to short-term. But Kurt, you mentioned that we are struggling with that and we still want to do better. So my question to you, what can we do? I understand that Boulder wants to meet its long-term goals, which is housing people, but what can we do, whether it's with the county, to take care of some of the short-term needs? Because guess what? In a community, we can't just say, we're just gonna take care of the long-term goals, which is great, which is, you know, I mean, I've been to the, um, on the housing tour, and let me tell you, I was very impressed as a new council person but nonetheless, we still have to take care of the immediate needs. So we have to bridge the gap. And I think that's what many of the other council members just mentioned today. So if I could add to that, thank you. Um, so I think some of the efforts towards the short term, um, and, and I think you're correct, we've been, on, we've been focused on long-term goals. Some of the short-term activities though have really been um, the navigation, which didn't exist you know, 18 months ago. Um, um, that that service provided by by Bridge House that's that's a new service that really helps a lot of people with those short term challenges. Um, we're increasing that. We've added more funding to it. We have both diversion and navigation um, now, and um, the staff that are doing that are going to be they're they're getting um, training and um, support from other organizations that have different experiences with that. Um, I don't think we're done um, progressing um, on that. Um, and I think what the data showed us um, is that people aren't dying because they don't have severe weather shelter, they're dying because they're camping in the streets. Um, and that's, that's a real challenge that we have. I wanna um, channel Heather Bergman here for a second, who's gonna be our facilitator at the retreat in a week and a half. And I think what we, um, probably don't want our retreat to be as a second version of this discussion around homelessness and, and, and these great ideas that people would like to discuss because um, our retreat really is about um, a work plan. So I think um, Adam and, and, and Rachel and Aaron have, have suggested some um, things we might look at 
um, this year. Some of them may be things that folks, the majority in council wants to look at sooner rather than later. Others may be things that are longer term goals. So I, I guess my suggestion would be, and it sounds like some of you already put that on your list, which we'll talk about in a second, which is great. Um, my suggestion is, is, is come prepared to the retreat um, with a discussion, not so much about you know whether we should do this thing or this thing, or we should change this program or change uh, this system. The, the exception may be the, the, mm -hmm. the severe weather shelter, because that's something we probably could change pretty quickly. But with respect to Adam's really, really great l uh, list, it, it supplemented by, by Rachel, is, is really talk about how those might fit into a work plan. And hopefully, staff got enough from that tonight that you can start to scope in your heads, you know, this is something that would take a lot of work, and this is something that would not take a lot of work, and this is something that could be done quickly, or this is something we just don't think is a really good idea, and here's why, because other communities have tried it and it hasn't worked. So I think to the extent that we can have a discussion around, I guess I'll say process or, or prioritization as opposed to a substantive discussion about what we should do and what we shouldn't do, because I, I think to be fair to the staff, they're probably not going to be ready for that. And secondly, we really haven't put the community on notice about some of these changes, but we can certainly have a discussion about a work plan for some of these changes, and that very may well will involve a um, a working group, right? A working group that that aids staff and staff and brings in, in expert subject matter experts. So I'm just suggesting that, Adam. Yeah, really short. Um, I think a good way to frame it is, you know, we have a vision just at zero, vision zero for transportation and um, making sure that there are no deaths on our streets. And I think that's sort of what we're looking at for this homelessness situation is. You know, how do we make a vision zero where people aren't sleeping on the streets? And that's gonna be a comprehensive end to end solution, just like vision zero is for transportation. Great, well said. Anything else in this discussion? Yeah, Mary? So I, you know, I wanna just echo what um, Mark said right before he left. The work that's being done is phenomenal. Um, I think back to just a few short years ago when we didn't even have any data, we didn't have any plan. All we were doing was sheltering people and um, and trying to increase the amount of shelter, which wasn't really improving anyone's life beyond the short-term um, solution of putting a roof over somebody's head. Um, but it wasn't addressing people's long-term needs. And now that's happening, and we're we have data, we have um, I mean, teams that are coming together once a month and talking about it. We have an incredible collaboration going on between Bridge House and, um, and the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless um, with the city and with the county. And it's I, just what's happened in these short years is to be truly commended because it's, it's hard to believe how far we've come. So thank you for that. I agree. I don't think I, the, the only um, group that, that uh, Mary and Aaron, I mean, uh, Mary and uh, Mark didn't uh, mention that I would like to, to shout out for because they are at the front line of oftentimes our homelessness services and making sure that people that find themselves uh, are unhoused get to the right place is our police department. We have a homeless outreach team that's dedicated to interfacing with homeless people, not to cite them, not to find violations, but really to compassionately get them to the right place. And often our police are the, the ones that are interacting most frequently on the street with people that are homeless, that are confused about where to go. Um, they don't know the transportation systems. They don't know what's available to them. And so I do want to acknowledge um, not only the partnership of, of all the, the people that Mary and Mark mentioned, but also the, the police team, because the police uh, department, because they are an integral part of this broader team. Yes, and um, as well as and that's it's the homeless outreach team, and then the edge team as well. Edge team as well. Can we also call out the uh, municipal court and the navigator there and Judge Cook and her team who did yep. phenomenal work with what all of that stuff is new yeah, in, yeah. in just and the last few years. So and, and so many of the service providers in our community um, as well, like um, in addition to Bridge House and the shelter, the tension homes and EFA keeping people off the streets and a lot of other providers as well. So very we're very fortunate to have so many people of goodwill working so hard on these complex problems. Anything else to close? Okay, great, great discussion, great presentation, guys. Yeah, thanks. So Thank much. you very much. Sorry, we're not taking comments, but we'll we're going to be breaking in a few minutes, so we'll we'll join you down there in just a few minutes if you just be patient. Thanks. We're almost done. Next is your retreat update and clarifying questions. So um, we're having a retreat study yeah. session on Thursday. Okay, see you then. Yeah. 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 Good enough. Good enough. 
And then the, um, the, Doing the, the resettlement of refugees. Yep, yep, and then we'll be done. So, um, do you, Mary, do you want to um, talk about the three things we're going to do on Thursday night, or do you want to mention sure. them? Or? Sure. The three things we're dealing with on Thursday night are, um, one is we're all going to have our little um, slide presentations of the letters from the boards and commissions. Folks, if you, about uh, that. folks, thanks for coming tonight. If you guys can move downstairs for your um, goodbyes, that'd be great. Thanks a lot. Um, we're going to have uh, spend an hour um, going through the Emerge Genetics um, results, and um, and then briefly talking about the items that were sent in um, for the retreat. Those are the three things. And we're going to be facilitated by um, Heather Bergman, who ultimately will be our facilitator for the retreat. Um, and we, we thought we'd take a, a pause here. I think most, if not everyone, got into Lynette. Um, their list of priorities for the um, for the work plan that we'll discuss at the retreat, and we'll briefly discuss it on Thursday night. But we also want to take a pause here to make sure that staff, which is the recipient of that, which is going to try to scope some of these out for us on Thursday night, understood what it is that we lobbed in. So I guess the question is, Jane, is there anything you didn't understand of what we sent in? Yeah, so we have prepared a spreadsheet that we're going to hand out to you on Thursday night um, that I've gone through, and we have three questions. So. Um, Council member friend said under the proceed procedural items to change the voting method for a more representative and democratic result. And I, I did not understand what you're thinking there. Is that under board, advisory board appointments? Um, no, it, it was related in the same paragraph, I guess you wrote in addition, evaluate whether nine is the right number. Of oh, it was in elections was the heading on that okay. one. Um, and so I'm, that's talking about things like ranked choice voting. Oh, ranked choice voting, okay. A, as an example of something that's possibly more representative and democratic. Got it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, then we had a question for Council Member Yates. This is under comment register. City register for initiative comments by community. Yeah, thanks for that. I should have been more clear. Um, the analogy is to the federal register. If, there, if the federal government is thinking about um, um, promulgating a regulation or even a new law, oftentimes they'll publish that and there'll be a, um, a central repository for community members um, across the country to um, comment, provide comments within a window of time, 30 days, 60 days, whatnot. And, and we've had some community members that, that suggested that because comments come to us in lots of different ways, there's open comment, there's public hearing, there's um, emails to council, there's meetings with council, that one thing that we might create as a, a community register, not, not dissimilar to the federal register, which is a central place where people can put comments. Staff could obviously manage that and it would be up on a website and anybody could see it and council members could see it and be kind of a central place for all the comments to a proposed action the council might take. Yeah, I, I just didn't know yeah. exactly what you yeah. meant there. And I think I had one more. Yeah, um, it was council member Joseph's. Under improved human services, one of the things that you were talking about is rollout of an online reporting survey system based on social service provision by providers. And we just weren't sure what you meant by an online reporting survey system. Well, we do this. <laughs> providers or the homeless shelter people who utilizes that system can go and report and it would be available for the public to see how many we, how many people have um, lodged complaint against different providers ah oh, okay okay it's sort of a complaint reporting yes. system okay thank you great so out of the very many things that you had we only had those three great. questions and we will have um, a spreadsheet for all of you on Thursday. Great. Look at all of the items that we'll put that you all Super. Can. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, any questions about the retreat or what we're going to do Thursday night? I have a quick question. Somebody said Emergenetics results are Thursday. We had to like present our our, our partners Emergenetics something mm -hmm. 
Are we getting that information on Thursday to then discuss with our partners, or is that supposed to have happened already? Okay. Yeah, you know, actually, a couple things happen on Thursday. You'll get your results, but also um, there's a woman by the name of Heidi, is it Brink Brink Heidi Brinkman, Brinkman, who is the emergent eggs specialist, and she's going to walk us through what it all means. We can ask questions. Yeah, I'm by. Should we bring our results from two years ago? Or are they God, I hope not, because I have no idea where mine are. So are they going to um, provide them? They? I found mine. I uh, was cleaning out my house. And do I we know, it, is, is, is she going to be able to, she'll, she'll bring them for all of us, even those who have lost them? Yes. Okay. Thank I'm you. I'm so excited. Okay. Good. Quick uh, reminder about the retreat. Yep. I have a wedding I have to be at, because I'm in it. Yep. So I have to leave at about two on Saturday. Okay. Well, uh, let's remind Heather of that when, no. when she's here on th Thursday. So we can make sure that we're we'll look at take a look, quick look at the schedule again when Heather's with us on Thursday and make sure that we we don't do anything important without you. Perfect. Yeah. Um, we have one more item, right? We do. Um, your next item, your last item, motion authorizing the continued resettlement of refugees. Any presentation on this? There isn't a presentation. We're just hopeful that you will authorize us to move forward with that. Someone would like to make a motion. Any, any statements? Good. Important. Okay. Is this a show of hands? Show of hands. Do, we need to have a, do we need to have a public hearing because this is oh, under sorry. matters? Thank you for that. Yes. We'll open a public hearing. Would anyone like to comment on this letter we're going to send to the federal government saying that we're happy to receive refugees? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. All in favor? Okay. Um, any other business? And by 10.30. Any debrief on the meeting? Good job. Good job. Yeah, good job okay, thank you. I wasn't expecting to do this, but um, I think at 10.28 we're adjourned. All right. Well yeah. Feel better, Sam. Do you feel better, Sam? You want to move still? Live from Paris, on France 24.